What an MMA-packed weekend. Welcome to another episode of Submission Radio. It's September 8th. I'm Dennis Shkradov. I'm here with Kasper Rozalowski. We have a big heavyweight on the show with a couple of superstars for you. We absolutely do, guys. On today's show, we've got big Ben Rothwell coming off his awesome knockout of Alistair Overeem just this past weekend. We've got Joseph Benavidez on the show. He's going to chat about his upcoming fight against Dustin Ortiz and a whole bunch of things. We're going to see if we can uh, if we can play a little bit of a game with uh, Joseph Benavidez that he plays on Twitter called Would You Rather. And we've also got Talos Laites. He had a very impressive knockout a couple of weeks ago. We want to chat to him, see what's next for him. And uh, he's recently said he wants to fight Michael Bisping. So we want to know what the deal is with that. A big, big weekend in MMA. In Victor fights, congratulations to Michelle Waterson on her comeback. Uh, Bellator 123, fun night there. And UFC Foxwoods, Gay Guard, uh, Musashi versus Jacare. Whole lot of stuff to talk about there, isn't there, Dennis? That's right. We talk about the rise and fall of Alistair Overeem. We find out our thoughts at the end of the show about what we think about the Reem, the man uh, himself, and what we think is going to happen in his future. We'll be talking about that at the end of the interviews. In terms of the structuring, we've got Benavides, Big Ben Rothwell, and Talis Laters. And, you know, I'm really excited for these interviews, Cass. I'm really excited to talk to these guys, and I'm really excited for the show this week. Yeah, it's going to be an absolutely awesome one. We're not going to waste any time. As always, guys, uh, check us out on Twitter at SubmissionAUS. We're always letting you know who we've got on the show and giving you the opportunity to ask questions so go ahead and do that now uh subscribe to the channel submission radio au we've got a lot of stuff including a nice juicy interview with kip dale and a whole bunch of more content we've got a uh, f- technique of the week coming up very very soon that's going to be a new feature on the channel uh till then guys we've got joseph benavides on the line and now we're ready to have him on now our next guest has just had his fight announced last week. He'll be facing Dustin Ortiz on November 22nd at UFC Fight Night 57. He's a staple at Team Alpha Male, one of the top guys in the flyweight division. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Joseph Benavides on the program. Joseph, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be on. Oh, well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And this is the first time that we've had you on, so it's kind of really cool um, the first time we have you know someone like you on the show. Now, uh, let's get straight into it. You know, last weekend, the UFC had possibly one of the worst runs of bad luck when Ren and Barrow, uh couldn't fight TJ Dillashaw last minute. I'm just, and thankfully, Joe Soto stood in at the last second. But I'm just wondering, from, you know, the Team Alpha Male perspective, things must have been pretty crazy last weekend. Yeah, I mean, you know, no one, you never really prepare for that. You can prepare to fight, uh, you know, train as hard as you can, but you never really prepare to have your opponent for a world title, especially, changed you know, the day of the fight, you know, 24 hours before. So, you know, here TJ is, you know, trying to make weight and uh, get rid of this Burrell character once and for all. <laughs> and uh, dude in his hometown, and all of a sudden, you know, he's fighting a new guy who is unknown, but, you know, also super, super tough, as everybody saw. So, you know, it was hard, I think, on both the guys and all the people involved in the UFC, matchmakers, you know, president everyone that works and and is involved in the organization so i think it was a tough time for everyone but you know the show must go on and and you know everyone did their best you know the champ i think tj really hasn't got enough credit for stepping up like soto yeah he went in and fought the champion but you know a lot of champions wouldn't go and put their belt on the line against such a tough unknown Uh guy and do it you know with a smile on his face and uh you know so i think tj went out and you know him and soto saved the day and it ended up being a great competitive fight and uh, and he kept his belt. Not only a good fight, but it was a good card in general. And you're right; a lot of champions have basically turned down the short notice fights. Um, just take us through it. When you when you guys in Team Alpha Male, when you and like you when you first heard Barrow's out of the fight, what kind of reaction did you guys have? And you know, were you worried that they weren't going to find a replacement? Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, I believe I found out. I was actually sitting at home watching the. Um, I was watching the Q&A, and, uh, and I think Uriah was doing the Q&A. So I think that's when we all kind of found out. Um, they had asked a question, like a fan had asked a question about it, and, uh, and I was like, no way, is this real? Sure enough, I got online, people started talking about it. Um, you know, there was just, I think, just a couple of people with TJ. He was about finishing his weight cut, you know, if not already done with it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was surprising, you know, you, you know, you – you know, I, I have faith in the UFC. I know they're going to do whatever they can like they did to find a replacement. But at that point, I was just – the only things I was thinking is either, you know, 
Jorgensen or Soto is going to step in, mm-hmm. if anybody. Um, you know, they made it happen, and I think top to bottom, even though there wasn't, like, great names on the card, I think a real fight fan or even someone watched the first time, you know, saw some really good fights. So, you know, like I said, the show must go on as business as usual, and uh, we're just glad, you know, Joe Soto stepped up and he's such a, a game opponent, and, uh, you know, he, here he is just trying to go into his first fight on the prelims and shake out the UFC jitters and make a little name for himself. And all of a sudden he's locked in the cage with the world champion for 25 minutes and, uh, and he did a great job. And just while we're talking about last weekend and Team Alpha Male, you know, it was a bit of a bittersweet moment. Another one of the veterans from the camp, obviously, Danny Castillo. He had a close fight with Tony Ferguson. We just wanted to get your opinion. You know, what did you think of the fight and the decision? Oh, man, I'm super bummed for Danny. Mm. Um, he's been doing so well, you know, not only professionally, but just, like, uh, like in his personal life. And it's really turned, like, everything around in his life, just, you know, his attitude and his positivity and everything. And, you know, he's a real inspiring figure. Like, he's, he's you know, the vet on the team. He has more uh, Zufa, you know, UFC, WC fights than any of us. So, you know, he's someone that everyone really looks up to and is inspired to, and he sets such a good example um, for the team. So, uh, you know, we're always going to look at him like that, you know. He's kind of like a big brother figure on the team for everybody. And uh, so, you know, it breaks your heart to see, you know, the fight end up the way it happened. You know, personally, backstage, it was the fight before TJ, and we were watching. And, you know, I think us and everyone in the room kind of had Castillo winning. Um, you know, obviously, we're cheering for him, and we're seeing all the things he did. He did. So, I mean, maybe there was a biased opinion. But, you know, I, I watched the fight all three rounds, and, uh you know, at the end, I walked away, kept warming up TJ because uh, I figured Danny had won the fight, you know, no question. I think Ferguson knew he lost the fight. Danny knew he won. And, uh, you know, but, you know, it's just, you know, you can never leave it to these judges. Sometimes you don't know. But I definitely think Danny had enough to win. But regardless, you know, Danny's a positive guy and he's ready to get back in there. He's had a good run. And, you know, it still just makes him hungrier to prove, you know, how good he is. And, uh, you know, he's only going to learn from it. But uh, it was definitely heartbreaking to lose in his hometown. But, uh, you know, he continues, I think, to be an inspiration for all of us. And uh, he's going to be a better fighter from it, too. Now, uh, Joseph, I just want to interject here. We've got a fan question that we usually do fan questions later on. But I wanted to ask this one now. It's Beautiful. A guy called Joth. And he was just wondering, why weren't you on the Sacramento card? It seems like it would have been a no-brainer uh, to put you on the card. Was there ever talks of yeah. you being on that card um was were you close to being on it oh man i tried you know right when i heard the card was announced it was perfect timing for me and i said i would love to be on the sacramento card get me on there it's just you know in the division right now not only the size of the division and kind of the lack of contenders and fights for me that makes sense you know like i'm just in a weird position in general so they're just i guess in time we couldn't really find a fight that made sense and you know i was kind of training all the way up till about well, well actually I was trained all the way through I haven't really stopped training since my last fight but I didn't really get you know official notice that I wasn't fine on until about four weeks out we're like all right we're just not going to make this happen but I was always kind of had it in the back of my mind because I thought they were going to really really try and find something so it would have been great um but you know it didn't it didn't didn't work out and I think the main reason is you know just finding a fight that makes sense in in such a in, in such a small division and and a fight with me who's in, you know, somewhat of a a hard position. So uh it didn't make sense, but, you know, now I got mine lined up with Ortiz, and, you know, he's a tough opponent, and I think that is the fight that makes sense, even though, for me, the time didn't make sense. It's a little too long for me to wait. I've been hungry now for a while for a fight, but, uh, you know, I'm just glad I got one, and it's against a, a really good opponent. And, you know, you just mentioned that you're in an interesting position in the division. Obviously, you're such a dominant fighter, but because you had a couple of difficult fights against Mighty Mouse, um, it's it's a little bit difficult for the UFC to figure out what kind of matchups to put together with you. But um, I'm just wondering, what does it feel like to be in that position at the moment? And is is the title still, obviously, your main priority, wake, working your way back up to a third match with Mighty Mouse? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you know, the, the fact is, the title's... Uh obviously the main goal and it always has been, and, you know, I know it's definitely something I can accomplish, but it's like a third fight with Mighty Mouse seems, I mean, that would be ideal for me, but like, that's going to make it harder. Like, I think the best way is really for him to lose, you know, for me to get another shot in there. 
But, uh, you know, if I keep beating everybody and he keeps beating everyone, you know, there's going to be no other real choice to make. So I'm just going to prove, you know, that I'm the best and I deserve it, you know, regardless who's the champion. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's definitely a hard position, you know, for me. Um, I think, you know, there's only, you know, a few people in the division that could even give him a test. And I know I'm one of them, and I definitely think I could I could beat him. Um, so, you know, I just need another shot. The last fight ended so abruptly. I know, you know, um, you know, would have went the whole time and, you know, I wouldn't have made such a mistake early. You know, I know it could have been a totally different fight and I'm a better fighter as I've ever been. Um, so, you know, I just got to keep working towards it and, um, just take it fight by fight day by day and, you know, can't really control him fighting and him winning and him losing who he's going to fight. So I just control my training and how good I can get in between and, uh, be ready when the opportunity presents itself. Well, speaking of, you know, making your way up that ladder, let's talk about your next fight. You're obviously facing Dustin Ortiz on November 22nd at Fight Night 57. Tell us about that matchup and what challenges do you see Dustin bringing to the table? Oh, I think it's an excellent matchup. You know, Dustin's a, a real good up-and-comer. Um, you know, if I look at his fights that I've seen him in, I think he should probably be undefeated in the UFC. Um, you know, he had a split decision with Moraga, and, you know, I honestly thought that went his way. Um... But, uh, yeah, he's a tough guy, and, um, you know, he obviously wants to go for the title, and he was, you know, one of the only people willing to go through me to get to the title and prove that, you know, he does deserve it by being, you know, the next best guy in line where most people want to, you know, skip that part. So I think he's excited about it, and, uh, you know, that's the challenge he presents. He's excited, and he's hungry for it. You know, it was a fight he wanted, and, you know, that's excellent. But, you know, those are kind of like X factors, but, like, obviously his skill i mean he's one of the most skilled fighters in the division you know he's went out and he's beat some tough guys in the division already you know fought tough guys in moraga he just beat scoggins who i think is a really really exciting like up and comer in the division and uh he's tough he comes from a great camp duke rufus's camp who uh, i have respect for all the fighters there i think they're one of the best camps in the world and uh but you know the way i look at it is ortiz goes out there and he really grinds people out and uh, that's how he wins and I just don't think anyone in the world, um, you know, can grind me out. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, not only in our division, any division, like, no one's going to, you know, what he does, he goes in there, holds you down, stops you, controls you. Like, I don't think anyone in, you know, first few weight classes in the world can, can grind me out. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a good fight, but uh, I definitely see myself coming out on top. Absolutely, Joe. And, you know, just take us into the preparation for the fight because we know Team Alpha Male, you guys have an amazing lineup of guys to work with and training. And whenever we watch a countdown or a build-up video, it always seems like you have so much great talent, and especially in the lower weight classes. When it comes oh, yeah. to, to you uh, preparing for a fight, is it a constant training camp for you where you're going in there and constantly working out with these guys? Or now that you know that you got Ortiz, are things going to go into, you know, the next gear and are you going to start uh, a different level different level of preparation leading into this one? Yeah, well, you know what? It's kind of funny. Like, with with us having so many fighters in the same weight class, a lot of us are in the UFC. I think we now have seven or eight guys in the UFC, and there's constantly guys traveling down from Europe and Canada and everywhere just kind of visiting us. So a few Aussie guys there as really, well, isn't there? There's a few Aussie there's guys a few there as Aussies well. Aussies there, yeah, hey. yeah. We got guys, we have everyone training there. So it's kind of nice. We always have different guys to test ourselves against. And at, I mean, at any given time, someone's training for a fight. One of our eight guys in UFC has a fight lined up. So we're in there helping each other. Like I said, I haven't stopped training since my fight in April. And uh, that's just kind of how it is. You know, fight camp doesn't necessarily exist for me. It's more of just a constant, like, it's my it's my job, you know. It's not like I'm going into camp now. The only real difference that changes is when I'm training for a fight, I obviously have to make a weight. Like, that's the only difference that really happens is my diet. But I'm always training intense. I'm always taking every practice, you know, and in there grinding and helping my teammates sparring as hard as I can. And, you know, that doesn't really change, you know. So when I have a fight, it's more just, oh, hey, now I have a time and a, and a date, and uh, I actually have to lose some weight. But, like, other than that, like, it's always just, like I said, just kind of business as usual. That's my job. So, uh, that's what I'm doing every day. 
Yeah, the signs of a true professional, Joe. Now, uh, much like in, in terms of Dustin Ortiz, you know, much like in some of your last fights, you will be the strong favorite coming to this fight uh, against Dustin. Does it ever mess with you? And how do you deal with the pressure of knowing that, you know, everybody expects you to win? Uh, I don't really think about that. I just know that I expect myself to win. And I just know what I kind of expect out of myself. And as far as everyone else, you know, they're not in there and they haven't trained. So... And I don't really honestly look at gambling odds. I don't gamble or anything, so I don't really know what most of it means and how big of a favor I am. But, you know, I mean, they think the same thing that I think when it comes down to it is I know that I'm supposed to win this fight because, you know, I've trained this hard for it. So, uh, you know, that stuff doesn't really bother me, what what the other people are, are, are thinking. Absolutely. And, you know, the UFC, uh, it's it's almost on every weekend now. The UFC travels to a lot of cities, and a lot of guys are getting to fight uh, in their hometowns. Um, how awesome is it for you to be able to fight so close to your birth city? Oh, yeah, that's actually really cool. That helps a lot. Um, you know, my hometown that I grew up in in New Mexico, is, you know, they're, they're not going to have a fight there. It's a pretty small town. You know, I got to fight in Sacramento where I've been training, and I think, you know, my life has kind of changed, and, you know, that's my adopted hometown. And uh, there was a show in San Antonio, but having a fight in Austin where in San Antonio, which is only, you know, 80 miles away, I have so much family that's going to come down and support me. And, uh, you know, that's just always good, you know, taking that many more people in there with you and knowing they have your support, uh, you have their support there. You know, it's uh, it's definitely inspiring to have that. And, uh you know, makes these trips that much more fun. Like anytime I can, I go fight, you know, I look forward to traveling somewhere like Australia, you know, was actually one of my favorites to stay three weeks, hung out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's always a plus about, you know, going to travel and fight somewhere. And, you know, with this one, it just happens to be, I have a ton of family right there in Austin that I'm going to get to hang out with, you know, got to fight in Brazil and see different cultures, Japan. And so it's always nice. So, but, uh, this is definitely nice get to stay, to stay in the States and, uh, and uh, visit some family in the long run, which is, you know, um, really important to me. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, Joe, we uh, basically told everybody that you were coming on the show, and the fans submitted some of their fan questions. So we just want to ask you a few of those and uh, get your thoughts on a few things, if that's okay. Of course, yeah. I'd love to answer some questions for the fans. Awesome. Uh, so some of the things they want to know. So Fly Fight 33 uh, his question is, Johnson is defending his title against uh, Chris Carriasso at 178. Uh, now, Chris is a great fighter, but is hardly known even by more hardcore fans. And Johnson is amazing to watch. However, his personality has led to a real lack of interest in his defenses. And Belt, I'm just wondering if you feel the matchup with Chris may hurt the interest in the flyweight title more, especially with such low buildup. And do you, uh, do you, see this, do you think this was the right choice to get the title shot by the UFC? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy, you know, it's, um, it's hard because, you know, there's already, um, I feel a fairly low level of excitement, um, with the flyweight title shots as of late. And this one, I definitely doesn't, don't think it helps as far as like, um, as far as excitement goes and the notoriety and everything, um, that like Cariasso and Mighty Mouse bring to the table, that doesn't help, you know, a true fight fan is going to watch the fight and, you know, take the fight away from it and what they thought of the fight, what they thought of the performance in the two fighters. And mm. I think they're both good fighters, but yeah, as far as, you know, getting people hyped about the flyweight division, you know, this fight, you know, doesn't get people more excited about it, you know, but, um, it's the fight that the UFC thought made sense. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, you can't please everybody, you know, you give someone a title shot and it's like, Oh, but, they didn't deserve it or whatever, or you give someone a title shot that, you know, just because they talked or you give someone a title shot that does deserve it and like, Oh, this would make more money. So you really can't please everybody. You know, everyone's always going to have their thoughts, but, um, you know, just, uh, the real fight fans and watch the fight. I think they're on a great card. They have some, uh, mm. like a great card carrying them with some fights under them and, uh, people are going to tune in. And the good thing about this is that's going to be a fight that people order for maybe some of the other fights. And, uh, you know, hopefully guys, those guys can shine in, in the main event. Absolutely. And I, I, I guess it doesn't really help that the fact that the fight was buried um, when it was on the other card and they didn't really promote it very much, but definitely something interesting. Uh, we've got a question here from Evil Steve. That's an interesting uh, name there, Steve. Now, um, Steve would like to know, <laughs> Steve would like to know your thoughts on um, Dana White's comments that uh, he believes that Uriah Faber and TJ Dillashaw may fight in the future if he makes them the right offer. 
Um, you know, you're in the gym. Do you think that uh, TJ and your I might put the friendship aside for one night just to fr- <laughs> have a friendly competition against each other in the octagon? Well, I know what has been said and like between them and like anybody else in the world can go and Google when you ask TJ or you ask Uriah and you can see what they actually say. And that's all I really know. You know, I mean, they train together every day in the, in the gym and they're not interested in fighting each other. You know, they're friends and teammates and they both helped each other so much in their career and uh, they don't want to fight each other. Um, as far as, you know, Dana White offering money and this and that, TJ said, you know, he doesn't, we wouldn't want to do it. He's already the champ. There's no need to fight his friend. Faber said the only way he would do it, you know, money's not really an issue to Uriah, and he said the only way he would do it is if TJ asked him, like, hey, we're going to make a bunch of money, and this is the only fight I could make that much money in. Like, So Faber would only do it if TJ was asking him as a favor, and, uh, you know, TJ I don't think would do that because he already kind of said he, he didn't want to. So um, that's what I think because that's what I know. <laughs> Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, now we've got another question. Jonathan Love sixteen from Twitter at Jonathan Love sixteen wants to know: You seem like you like Rocky. Uh, have you ever met Sylvester Stallone? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love Rocky. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Part one. I think people kind of joke and think about the other Rockies like a little too much, especially with the like Balboa and Part Five and this, and then. Um, like even part four, which is a great movie, but it's, it's more of like entertainment, like spectacle, um, which is nice. But like Rocky one and even two, I think are like Rocky one's one of the best films like I've ever seen. Of just, you know, the straight underdog, you know, loser, you know, mm. what, life was a one in a million shot and making something. So I think that's a great actual just movie. So I love Rocky. I actually have a poster of Rocky in my room. Me and my girlfriend watch it all the time. Usually before fights, I watch, you know, one through four <laughs> and just, like, check it out. So, yeah, man, it's, like, it's like one of my favorites. I can quote it, everything. Like, I love, I love, uh, I love just the whole story and everything. But like I said, I think, I think part one is one of the best. And I think when people think of Rocky, they kind of think, oh, you know, Mr. T or, you know, the Russian Drago and yeah. the training scenes and all that. And, uh, without thinking about how great, you know, one and two is and the love story and just the underdog story and everything about it and to answer your question and get off of that and my obsession of the movies um <laughs> i have never met sylvester stallone um you know i think it would be awesome I to feel... meet him but uh but yeah i've never i've never met him i feel like before i've seen him one time you saw him but i don't know yeah what were you saying I was just gonna say, but I think before like a UFC countdown, the uh, the the media team sit down, they watch the montages from Rocky. Someone stands there with like a ruler and like a whiteboard, and they're like, "All right, this is what we want, guys. This is what we want on the countdown. We want a montage like in Rocky." Exactly. I feel like you should start yelling Adrian in your post fight uh, speeches. I feel like no, but you know, the, I felt like the 2005 version was wasn't too bad. I I I, I didn't mind that one. You, you didn't like it. Which one, Rocky Balboa? Yeah, you didn't like it? Um, I thought it was all right. I mean, they did the best they could. I mean, it's nowhere, like, in the same, you know, like, sentence as Rocky one. I felt. But yeah. I thought there was some cool comedy in it. And it was nice for, like, a new generation to kind of see the story. And maybe, you know, the thing I like about that is maybe some people that had never seen the real Rocky went back and they're like, oh, well, now we have to watch the rest of them and maybe got reintroduced <laughs> and uh, familiar with, like, the rest of the Rocky. Yeah, you know? But, I mean, I enjoyed it. It was cool. I thought Pauly did a great job in that movie. For, you know, oh, yeah. I I, hopefully <laughs> they didn't work their way backwards down to one because that would be a tough one. And that's the one that had the two endings as well, and they put um, him losing in the movie and then him winning in the extras of the DVD. So I'm happy they went with him losing. I think they made the movie. But let's get yeah. back on topic. Um, we've got a little thing here. Uh, Joseph, it's called... Today. I know, right? Next, we should do a movie show and have you on. I think, that, I think people will really love that. But we've got a little thing we, we like to call the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. Basically, it's like a word association. We throw a whole bunch of questions at you, and you come back with the first thing that pops into your mind. So are you oh, ready? Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, I am ready. Of course. Okay. Here we go. Now, you've been fighting since 2007. What keeps you motivated in the gym? And do you ever have moments where you have to take a break from MMA? Um. What keeps me motivated is just, you know, my supporters, just life, my loved ones, and, you know, um, just everyone that's kind of been there for me and sacrificed for me, you know, I'm fine for them every time I think, 
in the gym, you know, something's hard to think about, you know, what everyone else does for me and supports me. And, uh, and also that, Hey, I can only do this so long, might as well, you know, give it my all right now. You know, if I'm in the gym, it's just like, all right, I can't, I'm not going to be able to do this when I'm 40. I can't, like, I don't want to work out right now. Oh, well, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I just give it my all every day and, you know, just try to make the best of this life and this opportunity that I have. Good theory. Uh, Joe, what was the coolest thing about fighting in the WEC? Uh, just being, I kind of feel like a pioneer in the lighter weights and being kind of the first, you know, uh, being mentioned with the first people to kind of start the, the weight class. And, you know, that even goes on with the 125. But, you know, we were like the first, you know, surge of, of you know, fighters under 155 pounds to do it. And uh, it was all those guys in the WC that you think of when you think of the WC. And, you know, for some reason, which it hasn't really changed lately, uh, but I feel like I always used to have a teammate on the card mm. with me in the WC for some reason. The shows were smaller and a little more intimate. And, you know, we're always on the main cards and stuff. and didn't have to worry about all these bigger guys that, you know, people know a little bit more. Mm. But uh, I think that's changing, too, because it seems every fight I am on now with eight guys in the UFC, we have guys on the card every time, too, and the small guys are starting to take over. So uh, it's only a matter of time before we get back to it. Absolutely. Now, this is a little bit different, Joe, but um, unfortunately, when you were playing Would You Rather on Twitter, we missed out on the action. So we'd like to set the record <laughs> straight for all the fans listening at home. Uh, me and Cass, we're going to break it down and give you our answers. So here we go. Okay, so my answers Perfect. are Kim Kardashian over Khloe Kardashian, easily. Nikki, Nicki Minaj over Miley Cyrus. There shouldn't even be a competition there. Jennifer Lawrence Wait, over Taylor. Wait, what, 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 what were the Kardashian one? Uh, Kim Kardashian over Khloe Kardashian. Nikki, yeah. Okay, oh, Kim so, over Khloe. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Nicki Minaj yeah. over Miley Cyrus because we can't stand her. Jennifer, Nicki Minaj over Miley. Can't fault yeah. you there. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer Lawrence over Taylor Swift. And that's that one's any day of the week, twice on Sundays. <laughs> and then twice and then, on Sundays. Nice. And then obviously <laughs> we've got well, I have. Cass was gonna tell you his picks in a second, but I have Jack Nicholson over Meg Ryan. Not only is he better looking, but he's a better actor too. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. I'm glad you guys got in and we get to have, you know, the I get to actually hear the answers. Well, I'll let That's you know awesome. my picks as well. And funny enough, they're pretty much very Ours similar. Ours were somewhat to similar. I, I had Chloe over Kim. You had Chloe? Why and, did you have Chloe? Uh, I, just, I just like her more. I think she's more, she's big, but she's proportional <laughs> as well. And I think she has a way, not that this matters all the time, but I feel like she has a better personality mm. than Kim. And she's one of the only ones on there with a personality. But like she's proportional with her body and her butt and everything. And, I don't know. I just think she's pretty. I think she's really taking the reins as the prettiest one for me. Oh, man. Kim's like top three for me. Here's the thing, though. It, it reminds me of George Costanza. You know when he's like, he wants to be with a really tall woman who he can just climb? Is it something like that? Yeah. <laughs> it is. It definitely is. Oh, man. You get the nail on the head there. I, I hope to find that one day. Well, for me, it's Kim for sure. Uh, Nicki Minaj over Miley. I mean, you've got a, a massive contrast there. Miley Cyrus is like really, really small. And then you got Nicki Minaj. Yeah, that's what I was going for. Yeah. Some well, people pick Miley just because she's that shit crazy, and we're just like, she has to be like fun in bed. She's a psycho. Mm. Um, I think that's why most people were picking her. But uh, but yeah, I, I think I would go with Nicki as well. I mean, that's just that's just something something different, you know. I think Nikki would be the crazy one in bed. I think with Miley, it's a bit for show. I think, you know, you might yeah, find yourself disappointed exactly. in, the, in the bedroom. Jennifer Lawrence, well, you know, I've never been the biggest Jennifer Lawrence fan. She's always been, you know, cool, but I've been way less of a Taylor Swift fan. And uh, after the, yeah. know, the other week in Jennifer Lawrence news, all i got to say is she gets a respect. So I've got Jennifer Lawrence in that one. And Jack well, Nick Oh, because uh, the news? Yeah, yeah. But you saw the news, and now you haven't seen Taylor news. Wouldn't you like to see them both? You know, you know what, what I mean? I'm not that amped up for Taylor Swift nudes, just to be honest. I mean, I'll take them. A man's got to eat, but, you know. <laughs> for sure. And Jack Nicholson, I mean, well, you'd be you'd have a lot more funnier stories, and you're guaranteed to be at the Laker games every single week, so Jack Nicholson for sure. <laughs> exactly. And, and just Bruce Jenner with... or Chris Jenner? Bruce, uh, with, uh... Oh, man, Bruce, any day, of course. Yeah, Bruce has the Bruce, nice Bruce hair. Bruce with the ponytail, uh, of course. Uh, He's a dream boat. But I was going to say, um, just before we get off this uh, strange topic, um, it seemed like Taylor Swift, Miley Cyrus, and Khloe Kardashian won, um, won officially on your Twitter. So 
We don't know who's making yeah. these, what kind of crazy people are making these picks, but yeah. um, that, that's, there's something needs to be fixed. I feel like the judging and uh, who would you rather <laughs> needs needs work. We need to get John McCarthy in there. But anyway, let's get back into the submission radio. Cast. All right. Well, next time I'm playing, next time I I decide to play online, I want you guys to. Uh add your vote in maybe maybe we'll change it maybe we'll change the answers <laughs> yeah we got we got we got to get in there we'll, we need all of australia to get in there and make it right we'll get we we'll use these australian I'll judges. make sure it's on aussie prime time and it's not when you guys are sleeping because that's always a problem too with australia seeing mm. the tweet you know what i mean awesome okay so let's get back into the tap out round now what's the latest news on the coaching situation <laughs> team alpha male we heard about uh, Martin Campman being a possibility. What, what's the latest in the search? This is like um, American Idol right here. It, it feels it like is. it's, it's a wild. drawn out process with one winner. Yeah, it's tough stuff. Um, you know, I feel like Dwayne has done such a great job and it's going to be really hard to fill his shoes. But, you know, he made the decision of wanting to go start his own business and you can't really fault him for that. You know, he thinks that's the best thing to do for him and his family. So he's doing it. Um, but I think he's going to continue to be a part of the team, you know, kind of when he can, but he's kind of given up head reign, you know, over the team. So we have to go out and look for something else. And the way I look at it, you know, no matter who we get, you know, we're going to have Dwayne and kind of the skills he taught us and, and, you know, the way we've grown with him as a fighter, like we're not going to lose that. And the way I look at it is we're not really changing. We're just getting to add things on, you know, we're getting to add more knowledge. There's so much knowledge and, and everything out there. And we're just going to add it on. You know, it's looking like Martin Camp is going to be coming down this month of September and looking to kind of take over full time. So, you know, he's such a knowledgeable, experienced um, fighter. And when he was down here, we thought he was a great coach. So he's going to come back and, and, and start helping us. And we're going to see how that works out. Um, so like I said, I mean, I, I think it's great. You know, we're just really adding on, you know, techniques and coaches. And we're going to still continue to drill with what Dwayne has kind of given us because uh, it's helped. And uh, we have them come down, you know, kind of whenever whenever possible. So uh, I think we're getting the best of both worlds and still have great coaches. And, you know, before Dwayne came, we were successful without even having a coach. Not that I'd ever want to go back to that. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're always going to, you know, we're always going to go out there and give it our all. And, you know, I think we're meant to fight, you know, at heart. And we're going to always go out there and succeed, you know, with our hard work and, and talent in general. So, uh this is just giving us also, you know, a better chance here. Absolutely. Now, uh, Joe, clearly from your Twitter, uh, you're a baller. So who is the best two and two combination <laughs> on the court from Team Alpha Male? Oh, well, me and Holdsworth are undefeated mm, yes. uh, right now. Yeah, we're, we're pretty awesome. We've got a mean pick and roll, you know, <laughs> running gun, you know, a feed Holdsworth in the post, <laughs> you know, um, and I got the speed. It's nice. But yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're undefeated so far. So, Probably me and Holdsworth. We've been we we like to do a lot of that, you know, on the team. Just like, you know, if we're not fighting in the gym, you know, we'd like to go do other stuff. Everyone's competitive, you know. We're big volleyball players, and um, you know, just whatever. I got like a horseshoe pit in my backyard. We're just we're always playing board games and stuff, and just really whatever we can do. But uh, but yeah, as of right now, me and me and Holdsworth are the champs on the on the b-ball court. Absolutely. I'd love to see a heated Monopoly game between you guys. And now finally, yeah. Joe, how are you planning on winning against Dustin Ortiz at UFC Fight Night 57? You know, it's a while away, but how are you planning on winning that one? Um, You know, just definitely by a finish and going out there and just, you know, going for a finish nonstop like I always do. And, you know, I go out there and, you know, I don't think there's any secret. I'm just trying to finish the person at all points, and I'm always putting on an exciting fight. So, uh, you know, I definitely think I could finish him, whether it be on the feet or submission. Uh, I think he's a great grappler, and I always like to beat people in their own game. Uh, kind of made a name by doing that. So beating him in that realm, like his wrestling, grinding, you know, submission weight, that would be great. But I'll always take a knockout, you know, makes for an easier night. So, you know, I'm just definitely always looking to finish and excite the crowd and give him something to remember. Awesome, well, we can't wait. Guys, don't forget, you can catch Joe on Twitter, at Joe Jitsu. And, of course, watch the fight, Dustin Ortiz versus Joseph Benavidez, Fight Night 57, November 22nd. Or, if you're in Australia, due to the time difference, it's going to be November 23rd. Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on Submission Radio. You guys know it. Appreciate it. Hey, this is the Ultimate Fighter 17 winner, Kelvin Gaslam. You're listening to Submission Radio.
Coming off a big win over Alistair Overeem at UFC Fight Night 50, our next guest is a veteran in MMA. He's had fights, some of the most exciting fights and guest heavyweights in the UFC. We have none other than coming off his big win, Big Ben Rothwell on Submission Radio. Ben, welcome to Submission Radio. Hey, you guys. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, and um, and thank you for taking a moment from your celebrations to join us. Um, you know, you had such a great performance over the weekend um, at UFC uh, Fight Night 50. I'm just wondering, how have the last 48, crazy 48 hours been for you? What has Ben Rothwell been doing since his big victory? Uh, honestly, not a whole lot, man. Uh, the fight was Friday night. Um, we took an early flight home, got home Saturday morning. My wife and I literally, like, slept 12 hours. Um, we got a good eat. Like, we went out for dinner last night and, uh, you know, passed out again, got up this morning, and just been hanging out with my daughter and stuff and not really doing too much. Pretty pretty lame at this point in time and just trying to recover. Yeah, we're playing a board game right now. Exciting. <laughs> very, very understandable. Now, uh, in the fight with Alistair, you know, initially you thought you had your arm broken. Just to clarify, your arm isn't broken. Is everything okay with the arm, and how are you feeling? Yeah, it's got nerve damage. Um, the doctor at the UFC the one thought it was broke, um, the doctor of the commission. Um, so that's why he was precautionary, so he sent me to the hospital. They... You know, it was definitely swollen. It looked pretty bad, so that's why they were calling out for. Uh, they thought it was broken. We got X-rays done. It was just um, a bruised bone and um, some nerve damage, uh, and then some damage to my hand. So um, I'm okay. I'm, I'm fortunate. My the Rothwell bloodline has a strong, strong bones, so I'm, I'm fortunate <laughs> for that. So uh, I think that comes with a lot of my striking. Uh, I can. I have unusually hard bones, so I think it helps a lot of my striking game and stuff. So mm. that was with me, man. It kept me, you know, it was definitely would have set me back in the fight, though. My arm was like pretty much after the fight, and I started cooling down. My arm got really swollen, and it was it was pretty pretty messed up. So it wouldn't have been no good if I was fighting a tournament like the old days. But uh, <laughs> got the job done, you know, and uh, you know that was that. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in the countdown, you you spoke about how in your school, um, you teach to turn, when someone attacks, you turn that into attack on the on the person back. And, you know, you certainly came back at Alistair and had a really great fight. I'm just wondering, at that moment when he did land that blow across your arm, what was going through your head? Was was it a situation where you felt like you couldn't really use that arm for the rest of the fight if it went the, the distance? Or was it something that worried you? And, and how did you feel about the beginning of that fight? Um... The, the kick landed, it was, it was I blocked, uh, he threw a couple of them, I was, I was, I was dealing with the other kicks okay. Um, I dealt with it, and then there's a back kick just happened to get through, I didn't get my other arm across in time, and um, it hit, it just hit right on the right part of the bone, you know, it's chin on chin, I mean, it's, it's pure shin bone, there's no shin guards on it. it, it does change things, and when you feel it in a fight, you know it's bad, that's, that's, the, that's the, usually the call, it's the adrenaline is going, and all I knew is, I made a mistake. I didn't get the other hand across. I knew if I could keep get my defense off, either using my shin or using my other hand, um, I would have been okay. But at the same time, I, I did have some urgency that uh, I didn't want the fight to go much longer. I didn't want to risk him getting a chance to throw another kick and hurting the arm worse. So I, I just, I mean, it was, it was the game plan didn't change. So I was in there to, to end him. I mean, that was it, and that's just kind of my mentality. And it's like, oh yeah, you got a good knee through, you got a good kick through. But I was, I was very confident I was going to get a hold of him. I actually hit him with an uppercut that wobbled him, and, and it's just the momentum was on my side at that point in time. I knew he, he wasn't taking taking the damage very well, and uh, I knew it was just a matter of time until I put him down. Tell us a little bit. You know, what was your game plan going to the fight, Ben? And was there anything that surprised you about Alistair? Uh, not so much. I mean, I was kind of, I almost, I was yelled at him in the fight. He was, he was doing some real dirty push kicks to my knee, and uh, it's just a dirty move. It, it's not honorable in my mind because this isn't street fighting. Like street fighting, if you're fighting on the street, I'm undefeated, and I will remain so. And if I'm not, it means I'm dead. If he wants to fight like that, then I'm gonna start. I'm gonna rip his eyes out. I'm gonna pull his jugular out with my teeth. And I'm gonna break things on him. I'm gonna start snapping fingers. And he'll, you know, it'll be a lot worse on him. And and throwing push kicks at the knee joint is kind of like it's to me it's the same dirty method. It's like you don't do that. And I almost said something to him in the fight, like really, like you're gonna play like that. 
And uh, I luckily I ended him before he got to do it anymore. And that's just kind of felt about that. As far as the game plan goes, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys, you know, I'm going to bleep this out, but I, I, I said this to UFC, like, honest to God, this is my game plan. I'm going to beat your fucking ass. Like, that's <laughs> my game plan. It's very simple, but it's a mentality. I'm not, it, it's something that's taking you a long time to learn and understand. It's simple, but it's not just something you learn because a lot of guys got coaches around them that tell them, oh, you got to watch out for this. you got to watch out for that. you got to do this. you got to do that. You know what that is? That's just, that's just clutter in your brain. That's just holding you back. Now you're worried about them. Well, guess what? You're giving your opponent power then. Now you're worried about them. See, none of that happens to me. I'm only worried about nothing. I'm only going to do what I'm going to do. And that makes me more powerful. And pretty soon, with that kind of mentality, just like it happened in this fight, Alistair starts worrying about, man, I don't want to get hit with another one of those uppercuts. Man, I don't want to get hit with that overhand right. And he starts worrying about me, and I just become more powerful as the fight goes on. Absolutely, Ben. That, that's some great stuff being said there. You know, let's let's go back to your preparation for the fight. You know, after the fight, you thanked your wife. Um, you th- thanked the people around you for, you know, and you, you attributed some of the win to them. Just tell us a little bit, how much of a role did your wife and the people around you have in preparation for this fight? And, you know, how, how did the preparation go? For my career, this is one of the best training camps ever you have ever had. Um, it's it's not it's kind of an easy road to get here, but you understand that I've gone against the wants and thoughts of a lot of longtime coaches, legendary coaches in the sport. So I got to do it this way. I got to do it that way. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to go train at this big, big named camp. And I, I, I have them seen it as you're the captain of your own ship and you got to listen to yourself and you got to believe in yourself. And I've been doing this for 15 years and, you know, I know something. A lot of striking coaches want to change things and do things. And I go to them and I go, well, how many enemy fights do you actually have? And their answer is, well, I've watched lots of fights. Oh, you've watched lots of fights. That's interesting. I've actually fought, and I know what goes on and what needs to be done. So I've learned to begin listening to myself. As funny as it is, guess who my striking coach was this fight? Me. I was my own striking coach. And as you've seen the results, I must be doing something right. Now, I don't, it doesn't mean I do everything on my own. I have a great Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach, Luis Claudio, and I have an awesome team of guys around me. Some guys are starting to hear about, but a lot of guys you've never heard about. It doesn't matter to me. We have a system, and we stick to it, and we do it. And I also have a mentality and a rule that if I lose a fight, I lost the fight. I take full responsibility for losing the fight. It's my fault. I did something wrong. When I win a fight, it's because of all the people around me. We won the fight. It's the one portion of this that it becomes a team sport because everybody put in their good energy to help me get ready for this fight, and I thank them always for that. And my wife is a team is a team as much because you got to think. I only spend so many hours in the gym a day. And when I come home, what are you doing with your sleep? What are you doing with your eat? What are you doing all of those hours you're not at the gym? And those are crucial. Those are the most crucial points of the fight. And that's the thing that I think a lot of guys messed that part up. And I've really gotten to a great system. And by not going to some big bad camp and building my own gym in my own hometown, I get to come home and sleep in my bed. I'm familiar with all the things that are here in my, my hometown. I have a garden that I get to pick stuff from and eat the best organic food because it's organic because I know it was. I grew it. And my nutrition and everything is at the highest level. I get to be as calm as I possibly can be because everything has been built the way I need it to be built. Anything I need in my gym, equipment-wise, anything. I don't have to go to an owner of a gym and go, hey, man, we need to get this piece of equipment in. And they're like, no, you don't need that. I'm not paying for that. I don't have to deal with those things. I need it. I buy it. It's my gym. I need to go train at midnight. I go open the doors because I own the gym. I need to train on a Sunday morning when all the other big, big coaches that are, you know, with their families and they can't go on a Sunday. I don't have to deal with that. I get to go open the gym on a Sunday because I own the gym. So all of this has not happened overnight, but I finally got my place myself in a very, very good place. And I think you can see the results Friday night. 
We, we certainly did, and the results were very impressive. I'll tell you what, in terms of cutting promos, I think uh, not only at your gym should you teach fighting, but also the art of cutting a good heartfelt promo after a fight, because uh, we're basically seeing one unfold here. You know, you gave a very motivational post-fight speech, uh, as you have in uh, a lot of your past fights. You know, coming to the fight, you were, you were a surprisingly high underdog. Did that affect you in any way, and what did you think of that? It's just motivating. You know, maybe maybe in a different mindset or if things weren't going right, it, it might negatively affect you. You're like, oh, no, people don't, you know, don't think I can do it. And that's just, you know, that's a failure to believe in yourself. When I seen that, I was just like, I can't wait to prove all you people wrong. And that was my mentality. I was excited. I was like, oh, man, they don't even know. <laughs> that's why when, when I got up from the flight, I bust my hands and I didn't even knew. I unconsciously did that. But it wasn't to, to my point. It was kind of like to all the daughters. I was kind of like, I was kind of, I was doing it to all of them. I was like, there you go. And then Absolutely. I don't know where the dance came from. It just happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just let's just quickly while we're on the dance. It, it was awesome, by the way. Everybody loved it. Um, was this something you planned? It was a, just a spur of the moment no. thing. And, and can yeah, we see the dance not. in the future? Just... For, is it a knockout dance? Is it the new Ben Rothwell knockout dance that we can see? Every time you get a knockout. I don't know what it is. It, 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 it's more or less, I use footwork like that in my fighting, and the fight just didn't get deep enough into the fight. If you watch my brain and Vera fight, I yeah. started doing it. And I combined that with striking, and even against brain and Vera, I was just moving my feet like, I was kind of like, Ben, you're doing it. You know, it's starting to happen. And I didn't even get into the full mode uh, of what I do with it. And then after the Alistar fight, I just, I kind of got up and I had like this burst of, like, I didn't get to use it. So I was just like, well, I'm going to do it now. Like, like it was kind of one of those things. And then it became a dance. And I was like, oh man, I was just laughing to myself about it. Like, <laughs> it was one of those things. My, my next, in the future, I think you're going to see it. You're going to see it in action. You're going to see what, it, you know, just what I can do with it. And it's not going to be good for my opponent. I can promise you that. <laughs> Yeah, it was absolutely awesome. What's well, funny, before the fight, we actually put up a tweet on Twitter. Uh, I think we tagged you in it as well, saying something like, Ben Rothwell's going to win via sexy dancing. We had that little gif of you, uh, you know, do, doing the dance right before you knocked out Brandon Vera. So it was really good to see it afterwards. Um, now, with your, cool. big, with your big win over the weekend, you know, you're sitting at a, a two-win win streak. Where does that put you in the heavyweight division? And uh, who would you like to fight next? Yeah, I don't care where the rankings are. It doesn't matter to me in the slightest. But And I don't know how long I'll have to wait. And I don't know if Junior DeSantos is, is already matched up. And he, is, he hasn't fought since he lost to King Alaska. Is I'm correct, right? Yes, correct. So he probably may be set up to fight somebody else. Um, but that's a fight that, I would, that I'm almost interested in. I really thought about it the last couple of days. <clears throat> I thought about different opponents. I really don't want to fight anybody else but him. I mean, he's still ranked number two. And he's the one that I think will make me a number one contender. So, you know, but it's going to be exact same play as the last one. Everyone's going to doubt me, make me fight a one underdog. Great, thank you. Let's do it. So start the fight up. I'll, I'll sign the contract. Let's do this. And you know, you know, Ben. And speaking of Alistair, you know, a lot of people have been questioning his future in the heavyweight division because obviously he's had some tough losses. Just from your thoughts, obviously you're a veteran in the sport. How, how much longer do you think Alistair has left? Do you think he needs to change up his game plan? Do you think this is the right weight class for him? Do you see him fighting on in the future in the UFC? I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof that, you know, you could look to me after my Mark Hunt fight and you'd have thought my career was over. And look where I'm at now. You know, anything can happen. It, it's kind of each, it, it, it's on the individual. Do, could he be more competitive at 205? Perhaps, but there's some monstrous bad dudes at 205 too. So it's not really, you can't really run anywhere. I mean, he, he just, he's got to figure himself out, I guess. And, uh, you know, only, only he can figure that out. Absolutely. And, you know, I just want to go back to 2009 quickly when you were brought to fight Cain Velasquez. Obviously, um, you know, everybody was excited about you. Many fans believed that you would be a future UFC champion. After that, though, you had a couple of difficult fights. You had some injuries, like you mentioned. You went around to some camps. And what people don't realize is, even though you're such a veteran, you're only 32 years old, so you're very young in the sport. Now, um, after your win over on Friday, is the title still one of your main, main priorities? And was, was this the beginning of your campaign for coming for that title? Yeah, it's the only thing that matters. That belt's mine. 
that, that, that belt, someone's got it on hold right now. Whether it's going to be continue to be Kane or Verdum, I don't care. Keep it polished for me. That's my okay. belt, and I'm okay. going to get it. Period. Awesome. I don't care, you know. I let the whole world continue to help me. You don't know me. And you have no idea what I'm about to bring to the table. Well, we can't wait and definitely get us excited. Now, uh, Ben, we've got, we told the fans that you were coming on the show and uh, obviously everyone's excited to talk to you. So we let the fan ask, ask a few questions. We were just wondering if that was okay with you, if uh, we shared some of those questions. Sure. Okay, so 315 MMA fighter wants to know, Big Ben, at the exact moment you knocked out Alistair, what went instantly through your mind? I, I, you know, I don't have anything cool to say because I kind of woke, I kind of stood up and I was just like, Ben, put your hand up, you won. Like, I was like, <laughs> having to like, tell, it was like, it was kind of hard, you know, because all my other fights, it's like, after I knocked out Shab, I kind of was like, yeah, you know, and you're just a typical guy. Like, I just won, yeah. And I didn't have any of that. It was a completely different fight for me because I stood up like, like I did my job. Like, this was different for me. This was like, I, I believed in myself more than I ever had in my whole career. And I stood up like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. It's like you don't brag to people for feeding your kids. It's like, well, you're supposed to feed your kids. It's not something you brag about. Well, I was kind of the feeling that I was supposed to knock you out. I don't, I'm not, you know, I stood up like, yeah, that's how it is. And more or less, I started to, I think that's where the dance came from. It was like, well, I got to get the crowd something. I got to get the crowd into this win. So I think that's where it came from. <laughs> now, I got a question here from Bill the Butcher, too. He says, You already fought the champion, Candy Velasquez, once, like I mentioned in 2009, and you lost that fight. Um, if you're going to get a title shot and face him again, what would you do different? I'm just a completely different fighter than I was then. And it's, he, he's improved as well. Uh, that's obvious. What I would do different is it's already it's already done. I already am different. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is you're going to have to just tune in and watch when that fight happens. Well, we certainly will. I'm going to shock the world. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> we certainly will. Um, now, Ben, we really appreciate, obviously, you giving us this time, especially just right after your fight. Uh, before we let you go, we're going to do something fun with you. It's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. It's the getting to know you round where we ask a whole bunch of fun questions, and uh, you want to answer them, sort of like word association, just with the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'll try. All right. Ben, uh, after your after your victory over Alistair Overeem, is it true that you'll be following Randy Couture and uh, joining the season of Dancing with the Stars? Did I, did I go and sign up for Dancing with the Stars? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, after <laughs> after the victory dance, will you be joining Dancing with the Stars? I bet you I might get offered the opportunity, and I'll do it. <laughs> Let's go. Now, this is sort of a fan tap out question, but how much uh, Fallon Fox Goat would like to know, how much money did uh, you raise for the kid, for that kid um, when you were promoting your ALS Ice Bucket Challenge? Um, I think I, I'm waiting for the bonus to come, but I believe it'll be $5,000 that we'll be donating uh, wow. to him. Very wow, nice. that's great, yeah. Now, uh, Ben, after a tough training camp and a hard fight, what's the first thing Big Ben Rothwell likes to eat as a victory meal? I didn't get. I honestly didn't get what I wanted. There was nothing open at midnight, and I had to <laughs> settle for crappy Chinese food that was open at one in the morning. Uh, and then uh, it kicked us out. I didn't even get to finish. I was like trying to eat it, and they're like, "Okay, you go now." I'm like, "Oh man!" <laughs> so it was like, but then right after that, I got to have a Dunkin' Donuts uh, Oreo like Oreo smoothie. So that was that was good. Nice. It'd be awesome if, like, you were eating in that Chinese restaurant and then as they're telling you to get out, like, the fight replay is playing and they're like, okay, okay, you stay, you stay now. <laughs> now, Ben, we want, yeah, you to finish no clue. we want you to finish the sentence for us. People don't know that I... I'm going to be the future UFC champion. Very nice. Uh, ben, who's one person from past or present in MMA that you wish you got an opportunity to fight? Past or present, a fighter that I got the opportunity to fight? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fighter, but yeah. Or just anybody? Anybody, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm trying to get in the fighter, but I want to fight right now. Uh, maybe, maybe at the time, the Travis Brown fight. Yeah. Just to keep the fighter in. Because outside, I don't really want, there's nobody I want to fight. You know, if I can't fight the best in the world, then what's the point at this point in time in my life and career, you know? Mm. 
Absolutely. Now, speaking of the best in the world, well, it's I'm past, past that. Like, he, he, I, just, I just want to clarify that Travis Brown talked a lot smack to me after I called him out about I wasn't on his level and blah, blah, blah. So now it's like the tables have turned. So I'm already by, I'm already past that. Mm. So he can, he can work his way back up. I'm going <laughs> after the number two spot to become the number one contender. Well, yeah, that's a great point, actually. You know, now that Travis is coming back, he, he'll probably be the person he's going to try and fight. So if he does try and match up with you, your answer would be get in line. Is that right, Ben? Oh, yeah. I want to play Junior DeSantos. Absolutely. Well, back back to the tap out round. It's prediction time. Uh, who wins between Vadum and Velasquez, and how do they win? Yeah, that's probably um, – it, it's actually – I think a lot of people will be pulling for Keen on that, and it's obvious he's got a really good uh, fighting – you know, style for himself that's working out for him in heavyweight. But his particular style uh, might play into Verdun's game. And I think Verdun is very capable of keeping him, um, you know, beating him on the feet. So team may maybe try to look for the ground and pound and, and whatnot, and, and that may play into Verdun's game. Verdun could easily catch him. But the fact that in Mexico City may be taking an extra, you know, advantage of, uh, because the week of the fight can really matter, getting a guy ready and keeping his mind right and food and all of that. It might play in where the team's a game. So I don't think it's going to be a great fight and a close fight. So I'm, I'm going to give it based on Kane, based on the fact he's the champ and have some things going for him. I will not be surprised if Verdun catches him all. Very good insight. Now, Ben, in 2001, when you started your career, did you ever think that you'd still be fighting 13 years later and especially on such a large stage? I did. I, I think I've always always believed that I was going to prove I was one of the best fighters in the world. The longevity, um, you know, I think I might have been a little farther ahead. I think there's a couple key fights that I, I expected. You know, I, I thought now I should have won, but I wasn't who I am now. And everything happens for a reason, and I'm just going to keep doing this as it goes. Uh, and I, I don't want to be fighting until I'm 40, though, I can tell you that. Mm. And this is a bit of a fun one that was sent in from a fan for the tap out round. Taco eighteen oh eight would like to know top hat or bowler hat. Which one would you prefer? A top hat or a bowl hat? Yeah. Yeah. Top hats are cool. That's more my style. <laughs> yeah, we like the top hats as well. Now, Ben, just to wrap things up, you've just had your big fight. What's your plan now for your break? And when can we see you back in the octagon? Uh, when I don't know, um, I really just had no idea. I can't even give you, I, I want it to be six months or less, um, is what I would like, but I got a first, I, I'm going to need, I'm going to need, I'm going to need a month of healing here if I get back into training camp. Uh, and I need to go on a vacation. I think it goes somewhere warm Caribbean style. Mm. So that's my plan, but I will be back to my gym tomorrow. I'm going to, Gonna, gonna gonna be back at my gym and I'll be teaching my classes and uh, enjoying my time with my family. Very nice. Guys, you can catch him at RothwellMMA.com and, of course, follow him on Twitter at RothwellFighter. Uh, again, congratulations on your big win over the weekend, Ben. Very happy for you. And thank you so much for giving us the time uh, such shortly after your fight. Uh, good luck in your next fight. We'll be looking forward to it. If it's Gene Dos Santos, fantastic. We'll be watching. And uh, congratulations. Again, thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate it all, guys. Yep, thank you guys so much for having me on and best to you. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. You're listening to Submission Radio. Stay tuned or snap your arms off. All right, guys, our next guest, he is a current UFC middleweight and former middleweight title challenger. He's beaten guys like Dean Lister, Jesse Taylor, Jeremy Horn, Ed Herman, and most recently brutally knocked out Francis Carmont. He's none other than Talis Lates. Talis, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? Hey, what's up, guys? It's a great pleasure to be here and talk with you guys. Well, the pleasure is all ours. Now, something you may not know about Australia, Talos, we are in the future in terms of our time zone. And here in Australia, it is the 6th of September. Uh, so, you know what that means, Talos. We're going to play a little bit of something. Oh. Yeah, it is. It's my birthday. <laughs> it's uh, September 6th. In Brazil, it's not yet, but... It's September 6th in Australia. It's my birthday already. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it. We're trying to play some birthday music for you. But yeah, happy birthday, Talos. Tell us happy how birthday. you feel. Another year older, Thank another year you. wiser. What are the plans? Are you going out to party? <laughs> uh, no. I, I, will, I will spend my day with my daughter. I just want to relax and go with her 
and uh, ride a skateboard in Basco at the beach, you know, just relaxing. I don't want to, I don't want to do any party. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now, uh, tell us back to the fighting. A couple of weekends ago, you had a spectacular win over Francis Carmont. Um, how are you feeling, and what have you been up to since this amazing win? Uh, I, I felt great. I knew that it was the Carmon. He's a, a great challenger, and I saw all his fights. We studied him a lot, and we did. The game plan was perfect because I've been training my stand-up game for a long time, but I was needing more to be more confident. And all my trainers, my boxing, my Muay Thai coach, and everyone, and even my my head coach, they said every time, Thales, you have a head, have hands. You just have to believe. As soon as you go to the fight, when you hit the guy, if he feel, just keep going. Don't try taking him down as you, as you use it to do. And we start to work on it every time. And it happened in my last fight and a couple of fights ago and in my last fight. And, you know, that's it. That was The game plan was every time close the distance, don't let him, you know, come forward. I have to go forward and make him uh, walk backward. And this is exactly what I did. At the, at the beginning of the first, the second round, I got the distance and I said, man, I have to close the distance and put my hand on his face in right now. And this is exactly what happened. Wow. Cause, so going into that fight, talk us through it, because obviously you're more than capable on the ground, uh, but now we're seeing, you know, the striking evolution. Were you planning to knock Francis out or is it just something that happened because you saw the opportunity? No, no, no. The plan was it. And actually the plan every time, you know, it's try to finish the fight before the, the judge, mm -hmm. you know, before the judge score. And of course, I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. I will always represent jiu-jitsu with the pleasure. But MMA, he's MMA. The fight starts on, on stand. And when you get more confidence on stand, it's better because you can control the fight better, you know, on stand. And if the if the fight goes to the ground, you are more comfortable. Sometimes you you hit the guy and he try to take you down, and you you know, and then you take him down. It's better to control his, to control the fight. But the game plan, you know, exactly was was it. Finish the fight. Doesn't matter how or knockout or submission. And came to an outcome. Absolutely, and it was very spectacular, like we mentioned. Now, um, just on another side note, did you suffer any injuries during the fight? And when are you looking to get back in the octagon for another one? I'm sorry, I didn't understand exactly what you say. That's okay. Um, did you suffer any injuries during the fight? No, um, no, absolutely not. Some people ask me the same thing because he 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 did a couple kicks, and uh, I you know I I I, I, I lost my balance and I, and I put my hand on the ground, and they said that it, it happened something in your knee. Some my, my friends and my co they asked me. I said no, it was just when he kicked at me, I had to put my the top of my knee a little bit more to the, the left side, you know, and he hit it, my, my foot and uh, I felt I, I, I lost the, the balance, you know, just it, not, not at all. Good, good, good to hear. Um, now, mm. in terms of Francis, come on. I mean, Francis' last few opponents have been very tough guys in CB Dolloway, Costa Filippo, and Jacare Souza. Uh, yet you have been the only one to finish him in the UFC. What does that say about you in terms of the middleweight division? Well, it means a lot to me, of course. Uh, now I'm, I think I'm the number twelve. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's very good to me because he lost before me. He lost just for two guys and two, you know, top 10 guys, Dolloway and uh, uh, Jacare, who mm -hmm. is fighting today. And, you know, I won him. I beat him and then by knockout. I think he he wasn't nobody knocking him out since 2010 or something like that. They, mm -hmm. Someone told me before, after. In UFC, nobody knocking until you know until that time uh, had knocking him out and you know it is good to me of course and it you know it, it brings me more confidence of for sure and put me in 12 in, in the ranking the ranking is very tough i know mm. to get a top 10 is very tough and all the guys in the top 10 and top 15 is well deserved for sure
Absolutely. The rankings are very tough in the middleweight division, like you yeah. mentioned. And, um, you know, you mentioned that you possibly like to fight Michael Bisping next. Um, that was the big news coming out this week. Now, a lot of guys are calling out Michael these days. Um, what, 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 what's your personal reason for wanting to fight Michael next? And what is it about him that lures you uh, to that fight? Oh, actually, there's nothing, you know, personal between me and he. It's just because uh, Bisping, he's a good guy. He's an excellent fighter. He has a good name, and he's been fighting since when I was in UFC in 2006. He was there like me, you know, and I think it will be a great fight, you know. I was wondering if we put the, uh, the UFC put this, this, this fight in a... Uh, or in England, or in Brazil, doesn't matter, it would be nice to me, you know, and other thing is Bisping, he doesn't matter how, you know, what happened uh, during the fight, but he fight until the end every time, he mm. do great fights, and, you know, I think it will be a, a great fight between me and him. With Michael Bisping, you know, he often talks a lot of trash. You know, there's a lot of back and forth between him and his opponents. Seems like you've got a lot of respect for the guy. Um, and I think in that sense, Bisping may not engage in any trash talk. Uh, it seems like this might be the, one of the most respectful sort of exchanges between Michael Bisping and opponent. Don't you think? Oh, really? The, to me, it actually doesn't matter what my opponent will say. You know, what matters to me is inside the cage. Some opponent, I already heard some opponents tell him that they will kill me or <laughs> that, you know, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. This doesn't matter to me. What is important is when close the cage and the referees say go. Mm. That is the truth, you know? So I don't like to do the, tra the, the, the trash talk, but, you know, sometimes it is good to promote the fight, you know? But, you know, it doesn't matter. Actually, to me, it's, you know, <laughs> you just... You know, I just put in the trash, all this trash talk, I just throw to the trash and you know, and, and, and be focused on my train. I like it. I like it. It has a good ring to it. Now, Taz, I want to go back in time. I want to go back in time to your last fight against Anderson Silva. It was, it, it was a long, long time ago now, and we saw a completely yeah. different Talos latest in the ring. Um, I'm just wondering, in hindsight, when you get an opportunity to look back at that fight, what goes through your head? And is it hard for you to recognize the Talos latest that that's become now to the Talos Latus that was back then? Yeah, definitely. It's a different Talos Latus. And at that time, you know, I, I came from five straight victor. Uh, I was prepared uh, physically, but mentally, I, I wasn't. You know, I wasn't thinking like a champion. I trained a lot, but I wasn't training and thinking as a champion. You know, and I'm very you know upset when i remember when i remember what happened during the fight because i was a challenger and the challenge have to show to the public and to the world especially to your opponent why you deserve to be there you know how you want the, the belt and at the first round i was you know i had my game plan of course at the moment was closer distance taking him down but, you know, as I, I tried the first and the second round, and when I took him uh, to the ground and, you know, and he back to the to his stand-up game, I was trying to close the distance, and I didn't, I, I couldn't anymore. I was, you know, kind of uh, frustrated, you know. Mm -hmm. It happens a lot with a lot of his opponents because he break the guy even on, uh, inside the cage, but especially that had his opponent mine. And it happens with me. And I was after the fight. Said, "Fuck, man! It's I'm upset because I'm the challenge. I had nothing to lose. I have to go forward every time. Doesn't matter if he knock me out, if he submit me. Doesn't matter. But I had to be there to fight, you know. And this is how makes me more upset about that fight, you know. But of course, I work at a lot. My, you know, my confidence is the to me the you know be confident and believe in yourself is the like a 50 percent, and the rest is the your cardio, you know, your your physical, and you know your technique. But mentally, get well prepared. Mentally is the 50 percent, my opinion. So I'm I'm doing a, a, a I'm start to do it a long time. Is a mental coach with my friend, a friend of mine who lives in Arizona, is Gustavo Dantas. He has a, a program. He's a BJJ mental coach. Before was just for the the jiu-jitsu guys, and he started to work with me. And you know, 
if you saw my 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 fight short, there's bigger game and I'll quote just we we are working together. Wow. It is good. It makes me well better. Awesome. It's good to see, you know, when fighters and professional athletes take these extra measures, you know, to really get in there and, and solidify their mental game. Um, just quickly, yeah. b before we move on from, from your first run in the UFC, I wanted to chat to you because, you know, not long after the silver loss, you were cut from the company. You know, it was it was a while ago, UFC 101. We're coming up to UFC 178 now. Yeah. Tell us what yeah. went through your head after that. And, uh, you know, were you worried? Did you believe that you would make it back into the company? Uh, after the UFC 101, mm. uh, I had, you know, I uh, they cut me out, and I had, you know, uh, some both injuries in both. Uh, I had to, to surgery in left knee and right knee, 2011, 12, 2012. Of course, when they the UFC, you know, cut me out, I said, "Fuck, man, uh, what am I gonna do now?" I was fighting the biggest show in the world, but I have to put my, I had to put my you know my 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 brain and stop think about it and i said you know it's i i will continue to do what i love to do and i start to fight a show in canada and then in brazil and then i fought in sweden and it happens a lot of things in my life but it makes me stronger you know it is it is it's funny because it makes me stronger and gave me more you know uh, wish to get back and I put in my mind, one day we will get back to the UFC, you know. And it, I, I, I said to myself, I, you just have to keep working, keeping more dis, uh, confidence, and you know, still fighting. And one time you will get the chance. And it came in Brazil for was a perfect time. I get back to the UFC in Brazil, and the same card as my friend Jose Aldo in uh, Rio de Janeiro, where I live. So it was perfect with a, with a victory. And then now, <laughs> since I get uh, I returned to the UFC, I'm a four four win straight. It's perfect to me. Absolutely, it's almost like uh, you know, it, it's almost it's such a great story, and it's it's really great to see Taz. You know, um, just finally on Anderson Silva, you know, he's coming back to the UFC to face to face Nick Diaz. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. Obviously, you've set a whole lot of goals for yourself. Is rematching Anderson Silva um, up the road, is that still a goal of yours to really see how you'd go against him now that your mental, mental game is strong and it's, you've, you've got a completely different skill set? Look, it's not, Anderson is not a ghost to me, you know. The, the, I was upset with myself, not with him, you know. With my, 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 my things that I did inside the kid, not with him. He did his job, you know. Mm -hmm. And if he... If he it's not a, a wish, you know, like a goal to my life that I have to fight him, to him again. It doesn't matter to me. But if I have to fight him again, of course, would be, you know, would be well done and I want to fight for sure. You know, if I have the opportunity to fight with him again, of course that I want. Of course, he's a great guy. He's one of the biggest in a MMA. Mm -hmm. And of course that I want to rematch with him. And definitely isn't, he's not a ghost. He's a man like everyone else. You know, he has two arms, two legs, two, one brain. You know, he has two, two skills, but he has to weak, his weakness like everyone. You know, the problem that was with me. I was upset with me, you know. And mm. I'm, now I'm, I, I'm way well better, way better. Well, let, let's talk about some of those things and, you know, the, the reasons that you got better. Obviously, you mentioned, you know, your striking was a, a lot of it due to confidence and really going for the finish as opposed to relying on your jiu-jitsu. You know, who, who specifically have you been working with for your striking? And, uh, you know, what specifically have you, got, have you been doing in terms of, like, your boxing and striking training? Yeah, I, like I told you, actually, I've been training for a long time. I always train. Uh, I start training Muay Thai with uh, uh, Marcelo Guiar. Mm -hmm. And a great guy. He fought in the UFC already. He's from Muay Thai. He fought with Matt Hughes a long time ago. Yeah. And then I, uh, he's a Pedro Hughes' friend. And then I became um, Pedro Hughes' friend. And then we start training together. And now Pedro, uh, we are working for you know, for this last his the, my last fight. We I, I did just private class with him just to you know working exactly uh, the game. To, to fight with Carmo. And I've been working too with the uh, Alex Cardoso, the box guy from Brazil. Very nice guy, very competent, and he is very patient because uh, private class every time, me and 
one more or two more guys every time doing the you know the basic the, the basically that is the most important and working the confidence together with it, you know i mix it all and working together of course i don't forget the uh, the wrestling and especially the jiu-jitsu every time Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, as your skills have evolved, I'm just wondering, just from a fan's perspective, what do you find more rewarding now, getting the knockout or winning by submission? <laughs> Actually, the, 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 the sensation, of, to me, to me, to be honest, the sensation of the submission is, is better than the knockout. But victory is what matters, you know. So, you know, you, you, are, you are asking me what I prefer to do to – what I prefer, if there's the submission or if the yeah the yeah, well, what what kind of feels better for you? Ah uh, yeah, exactly. It's weird. It's 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 hard to say, but I think that the submission to me is better. You know, I feel more. You know, I don't know, more happy. It's it's weird to say, but I feel more happy, more you know, <laughs> more light. But the knockout, it's is great too. Actually, the victory, you know, is 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 amazing. But knockout is pretty good for sure. <laughs> I think with knockouts, it's a bit crazy because jiu-jitsu often takes a lot longer to set up the submission. Knockouts just out of nowhere and the crowd, you know, interrupts a lot quicker. But we wanted to get your thoughts, Talos, because a lot of guys who started grappling end up falling in love with the knockout and often neglect their grappling skills. You know, you could say that about, say, Rampage or a Fedor or a Diego Sanchez, possibly. You know, yeah. people have described that knockout as addictive. After your last two knockouts, you know... Do, do you feel that like it's addictive at all? Do you think like one day we'll see the knockout machine, Talos Lates? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Will be will be great, but I don't know. I hope so, but of course, I, I, uh, the 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 knockout, you know, is amazing. But I I don't know if I will if I will become a knockout. Uh, what 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 the word did you did you use machine. the knockout? The knockout machine. I don't know. It will be great, but you know, could be good. The knockout machine and submission machine will be great. Perfect. One hundred percent. We'll tell Bruce Buffer for the next fight. <laughs> now, be great. now, Taylor's one of your teammates, uh, Hannon Brow. He had a bit of a difficult time last weekend. He was unable to make weight and compete. I'm just wondering, have you seen Hannon since he returned to Brazil, and how's he doing spirit wise? You know, obviously, it was a very difficult weekend for him. Yeah, it was was hard for for everybody for Novo Leão. Actually, after my fight, I went to San Diego. <clears throat> I was traveling, uh, going to the Sacramento, and during the week, and I was almost there. I was a couple of hours uh, away, and I called to the to my to my coach to to ask how how was the uh, the Baron Baron's weight, and he he told me, man, man, you won't believe it. he he was at the he was cutting weight and he felt, you know, he, he, he didn't feel good. And I don't know how, how the word in English, but when you, you know, you, you like, uh, faint slip, huh? Oh yeah. When you, when, not, you, when you slip. Yeah. When you slip, he was, he was cutting weight in his, you know, kind of slip. And they was, you know, of course afraid and they was worried about it. And they, you know, they, they called to the doctors and they, they, they brought him to the, to the hospital to see what was going on and you know no way to fight i actually i don't know exactly what happened you know but it's it, it's bad for it for for us for sure not only for us but for the sport you know uh, he was doing the main event you know the the rematch but now we will have to wait a little bit and i think they will give to baron one or two more fights and then we will, he will get the, the title shot again but you know it, if if uh, when when things happen this way, is because he you know it, it wasn't have to wasn't have to to happen. You know what I mean? If it didn't happen, it's got is because it doesn't have to happen. You know, I think like this. Everything happens for a reason. That's what my dad used to say. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Doesn't exactly. say it anymore. But I was gonna I was gonna <laughs> say um just to squash the rumors a lot of. Fans have been saying, does this mean Hannon Brow is going to move up a weight class? From what you know, is he still going to stay in the same weight class, even though he had the issue with the weight cut? Yeah, actually, this thing, I don't know. Because in the other weight class, there's a, there's a Jose Aldo, mm. you know, and we mm. don't know 
what the dad will the dad is our head coach and i don't know what they will do but i think what we'll 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 keep in this way with this way division for sure yeah we'll have to wait and see all right tell us we're going to do something a little bit fun with you it's called the submission radio tap out round uh it's kind of like word association where we throw a bunch of quick fun questions at you and uh, you answer as quick as possible are you ready Okay, let's do it. All right, what's your favorite Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu submission? Uh, uh, arm triangle choke. Oh, that's the Brock Lesnar one. That's my favorite. Um, will, you, will we ever see you compete in Meta Morris one day? And who would you want to challenge um, in a friendly competition? Oh, it will be great opportunity to find Meta Morris one day. But I don't know who could be, you know, someone from the UFC and, you know, one day. It will be great. I don't know. I have no name in my mind now. Oh, well, the Gracies know now that you're interested, at least. Um, what is something about Talos Laites that we don't know? Uh, I'm a cool guy. I think so. We're, we already knew that. What, what, else, what else is there, Talos? Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a regular guy. I'm a normal guy who, you know, who likes to, to be with my family, to enjoy the nature, you know to see the nature, climb mountains, stay on the beach, and these things, simple things in life. Nice. Very, very nice. Now, it's gonna, we're going to do a prediction round with you, Talos. You, you tell us who you think wins in the following fights. You ready? Yeah, okay. Okay, here we go. Who wins between Anderson Silva and Nick Diaz? Uh, I think we'll be... <laughs> you, you ha I have to give my, my, my prediction or... The opinion, the prediction, definitely, or my opinion at all. You know what? Uh, we'll, we'll go with the opinion because we want to know why you, why you, you know, what the reason is. Uh, I think Anderson by 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 decision. Ooh. Ooh okay. Uh, who wins between Vitor Belfort and the Chris Chris Weidman? It's a tough question too. I think <laughs> if past the the second round, Chris Weidman, but. First or second round, I'm more Vitor. Your teammate Jose Aldo, how's he beating Chad Mendes? For sure, knocking him out for the first or the second round. Oh. <laughs> um, if you could, how soon would you want to return to the Octagon and fight again? Um, we know you fought December, a lot recently. Yeah? yeah, December or next year, January, February. Wow. Now, Talos, you received your first $50,000 performance of the night bonus. So we're just wondering, what kind of fancy things will you be spending your bonus money on? <laughs> Save the money to, to, the, to my daughter's education. Smart, uh, smart man. Uh, and uh, uh, last of all, when is Talos Ladies coming to Australia to teach some Aussies how to, uh, how to roll in uh, some jiu-jitsu? Well, I, sure, I wish one day I was, I was planning last, last year goes to the to Australia. I don't know if I can go, uh, if I will go to the Australia this year, but next year I want to go. Of course, I want to I wanna meet this gorgeous place. Australia is a, a beautiful country, big country, and it has a lot of good things that I, that I like. It's the simple things that mm. uh, enjoy the nature, see the beaches, you know, climb the mountains, and <laughs> all these things that I like to, that I like to do is there's, in a, you know, the, the, the nature is in Australia is, is well life. Absolutely. Guys, you can catch Talis on Twitter. Make sure you follow him at Talis Latest and also make sure that you look out for Talis next year if he does make it down to Australia. Otherwise, Talis, we'll be keeping on your career and making sure we get you back on the show when your next fight is announced. Otherwise, happy birthday for tomorrow. Thank you for coming <laughs> on Submission you. Radio and it has been such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time. Thanks for the opportunity to let me talk about my, my life, my career. And sorry about my English, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Taz Laitis, what a guy. Got him right before his birthday or on his birthday here in Australia and really excited to see what he does in the future. Isn't that right, Cass? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we'll see if that uh, rematch ever happens with Anderson Silva. My money's not on it. I don't think it ever will. But it's just amazing how far he's come as a fighter and how much of a difference confidence can make in one striking. I mean, the guy's... I think he's always had it in the striking department, but it's confidence that have really gotten him over. But it was a big weekend over the weekend. To say it was a big one is under uh, is a gross understatement. I mean, we had Bellator, we had Invicta, and we had UFC all within miles of each other, except for Invicta. Uh, it was a big one, wasn't it, Dennis? 
Yeah, it was huge, huge, huge. You know, MMA fans couldn't complain. Huge events from Bellator and Victor, UFC, like you mentioned. And, you know, these cards were pretty stacked as well. A lot of the time, you know, UFC might have a fight night and there's not many fights on it. This time around, a lot of really exciting bouts. And, you know, we've got some breakdowns for you guys and some comments on the fights. So I'm excited to get right into it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be talking about Bellator. We're going to try and talk about as much as possible. Obviously, before we go any further, Michelle Waterson made a comeback at Invicta 8. Uh, Waterson versus Tamada. Really good to see Waterson come back after about a year and a half of a layoff and she did manage to make her first title defense in the Adam Weight uh, title. Good to see the Karate Hottie back. She's basically the new face of Invicta um, and she looks a little bit like Jamie Chung as well which is not a bad thing. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't hurt. And you know, the thing with Invicta is it's a hot brand. It's getting really, really uh, hot right now. You can see a lot of people are taking notice of it. This Fight Pass deal was fantastic. I really see Invicta taking off in the future. The only problem, of course, Cass, was the stream cut out um, mm. near the end of the fight. Uh, a lot of people got a little bit upset about it. Invicta has had some bad luck with these streams. And, you know, that's just one thing they need to fix in the future. Um, apart from that, yeah, the brand's doing really well. And, you know, good on the Karate Hardy. She did a great job. Yeah, sometimes bad things happen to good people. But uh, <laughs> Bellator 123, obviously opposing the UFC uh, fight night in Foxwoods. Bellator was literally about an 8 or 10, I think, either kilometer or mid, uh, yeah, or minute drive away. So they brought out the big stars. You had guys like Chuck Congo, Lashley, uh, King Mo. You had the rematch between Pat Curran and Patrizia Ferreira. Uh, opening up the main card, we'll start with the main card, obviously. Uh, Chuck Congo beat LeVar Johnson. Uh, first round, all 3 minutes and 27 seconds is all it took. Uh, beat him with almost a crow cop versus Pat Barry style rear naked choke. Didn't quite have the hooks in. Um, starting off this fight, man, a lot of looping wild punches. It was pretty crazy exchanges. A little bit sloppy, to be honest. Lavar looking to pressure check Congo with his uh, power and, and strength. He actually tripped Congo. Yeah, he clipped him, then he tripped him. Uh, Congo went down to the ground. He ended up, uh, Congo ended up getting on top of Lavar. Uh, was working for, I'm not really sure what. He kind of had his arm pinned behind his head. Looked like he was trying to move his elbow. And then uh, during the scramble, John uh, Congo got in with the uh, rear naked choke. So... It's a good win for Chick Congo. He needed it. At the same time, LeVar Johnson, he's not exactly a world beater. Uh, and he doesn't really have much of a ground game. So we'll see. Congo recently came out and said that the UFC treated him like shit. He wasn't happy. He said it was always go, 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 push, push, push with the UFC. So we'll see if he you know, does a little bit better with the lighter schedule and, in all honesty, much easier opponents mm -hmm. than the UFC for Chick Congo. What did you think, Dennis? Well, you know, LeVar Johnson or Dwayne The Rock Johnson from Faster, as I like to call him, um, <laughs> you know, he's got that gap in his game, much like Pat Barry had, where um, he just doesn't have the grappling. And unfortunately, in MMA, guys like Chek Conga, even guys who aren't amazing at grappling, they still have enough skill to, you know, really uh, go into that area with LeVar and, you know, really exploit him there. So I'm thinking LeVar just needs to go back to the drawing boards and focus on that grappling. I like to see him to get in the gym, like you mentioned, focus on that grappling. He doesn't have to submit guys just learn how to get out, out of submissions be a mark hunt and um, I think mm. then he'll have a lot you know a, a lot more uh, a lot better fights and a, a lot more of a chance of making an impact in the industry otherwise he can just go over to glory because you know in MMA you just can't go into one skill set even in Bellator yeah well it's interesting you say that I mean Pat Barry even uh, mustered up some decent uh, submission defense much like Mark Hunt as well I don't think LeVar Johnson would do much better in glory because he's not exactly a technical striker he's a guy that has power um, and a lot of guys that are technical will take advantage of that or anyone with a ground game and check Congo I mean, when he came to the UFC, he had zero ground game. He, he mm. barely knew how to take a guy down. Now, he actually loves to really clinch guys and put them down on the ground and you know, really stay on top of them, which sometimes makes for not the most exciting fights. Speaking of guys that are coming along, we've obviously got Bobby Lashley making his return to MMA um, after being in the minor leagues and obviously being in TNA Impact Wrestling. He was versing Josh Burns. Uh, you know, Lashley really outmatched Josh Burns in this one. Lashley looked huge. It's the first thing I noticed. I mean, you, you watch him every week on TNA Impact. It's a bit different seeing him in the cage against other mixed martial artists to see what kind of size he's packing. 
So obviously in wrestling, everyone's big, so you don't really get that sort of comparison. Man, Lashley looked huge, and uh, sometimes people have said that Lashley hadn't had the greatest cardio, so that was going to be another interesting thing. Uh, one thing I noticed, no sponsors whatsoever on Lashley's trunks, just all mm. black. Uh, basically, you know, came in with some strikes, took Burns down pretty much straight away, and for the whole first round, he was working Burns' left arm, uh, going for Kimuras, Americanas, straight arm bars. Didn't quite get it. Lashley definitely needs to... Uh, you know, improve his submission game. Uh, what I did see, though, was improved striking from Lashley. Looking at him at the start, you know, he was getting comfortable. He looked very similar to Brock Lesnar, similar stance. The way he moved was very similar. But then once he started loosening up and getting a bit more fluid, it was like a better version of Lesnar. You know, he was pumping out that jab. He was getting loose. He was dancing around a little bit. Uh, he wasn't exactly Muhammad Ali, but, you know, for a guy mm. that was primarily just a wrestler he is coming along and uh he was he was firing away you know he was throwing some punches over the top of burns so it's it's interesting you know i'm not i'm not ready to call lashley a world beater hey his cardio stayed in there so i'm, I'm impressed with lashley and uh, he got the standy rear naked choke uh, mid scramble now josh burns Again, not elite competition, not exactly a world beater. So we'll see how Lashley does against the, the upper echelon of heavyweights in the Bellator division. But uh, I was impressed enough. I was impressed that, you know, Lashley didn't gas. I was impressed that he finished Josh Burns, and that puts him at a four-fight win streak. So it'll be interesting to see him, possibly against a guy like Czech Congo, who will definitely be a test uh, for a guy like Lashley in the striking department. And uh, I think Lashley should be able to out-wrestle Czech Congo. What did you think, Dennis? Yeah, you know, and I think not enough people are giving Lashley credit for doing the pro wrestling and MMA at the same time. I mean, mm. like he said, he's on TNA so regularly. How do you, you know, fit enough time into train? Um, you know, a lot of guys, especially pro MMA fighters, in the last couple of weeks, in the in the last month leading up to their fight, you can't even get an interview in with these guys. And you know, Lashley's uh, the champion over at TNA. He does his wrestling, so it, yeah, it's really impressive from Lashley. And like you mentioned, coming along, and it's good to see that he got a guy like Josh Burns first up, and not a guy like Czech Congo straight away. Um, so he can at least get back in the ring and get a bit of that ring rust off. Yeah, up next you had King Muhammad Lawal, King Mo, who was on the show uh, just about a couple of weeks ago uh, versus Dustin Jacoby. Um, this is a fun fight. You know, the first round started off a little bit slow. King Mo, he was uh, channeling Sugar Rashad Evans with some mm -hmm. taunting. There was, uh, the, yeah, it, it was basically King Mo on top, uh, you know, really sort of wearing down Dustin Jacoby. There was obviously some stand-up as well. Second round kicked in. That was when things started going crazy. Uh, crazy looping punches in round two. Uh, Mo ended up finishing Dustin Jacoby. TKO, I think it was about a minute and 40 into the second round. Mm -hmm. Dustin was protesting a bit, uh, you know, he was saying a few things to Big John McCarthy, Big John McCarthy with the, you know, keep your head up, you'll, you'll do all right. The, the problem with this <laughs> one was King Mo, you know, he really, he, uh, he dropped Dustin and he swarmed in there, absolutely swarmed in with punches. And, uh, you know, Dustin wasn't out straight away. It took a while of wearing him down. He was never knocked out at any point. But unfortunately, he did turtle up. And uh, Big John McCarthy gave him a lot of warnings. He said, you got to move, you got to move, you got to move. And he didn't. He honestly tur turtled up even more. So as soon as Big John stopped the fight, Dustin was a bit pissed off that he obviously wasn't knocked out. In, in MMA, it's not about until you get knocked out, you know. Some guys, you can hit him in the head or hit him in the arms for 10 minutes and they still wouldn't get knocked out. But they are taking unnecessary punishments. So it was obviously a very valid stoppage. Uh, another win for King Mo. Good on him. I mean, he had like three opponent changes. Uh, it was obviously Tom DeBlas, Marcus Serza, and then finally Dustin Jacoby. And good on Dustin for stepping in there a short notice. Uh, King Mo, man, I, I like the guy. He's a nice guy. If you listen to the interview from a couple of weeks ago, probably one of the most misunderstood individuals in MMA. Just a really nice guy. I reckon if you sat down with him, he would almost be, dare I say, nerd. Like, he could talk about him, talk to him about, you know, esoteric things and pro wrestling things. Uh, but, man, the crowd just doesn't want to love King Mo. You know, he did the DX chop to the crowd post-fight. Mm -hmm. Um and basically told the crowd to kiss his ass. People started booing. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about Mo. The crowd's very sort of 50-50 on him. But, um, yeah, you know, good showing for Mo. What did you think, Dennis? Yeah, you know, Mo is one of the franchise players in Bellator, and I think Scott Coke is going to look look towards Mo to bring the next the next change in Bellator that he's trying to bring in. Um, you know, an impressive win from Mo. Like you mentioned, hats off to Dustin for stepping in there, stepping in there on such short notice. I think fans want to see King Mo step in there with some more elite competition in the future. Hopefully, yeah. Bellator could 
put together some good matches. I almost feel like sometimes it's a risk when you do put him in these fights because there is a chance he could lose, and he has lost in the past. Every time he does, it kills the momentum he has. And if he loses against a top t- a top 10 guy or a really credible elite opponent, it takes away less from the company and King Mo himself. So I think Scott Coker is going to be looking towards that in the future. But, yeah, definitely a natural heel and, yeah, one of the nicest guys. So we'll have to get him back on the show and have more of a chat about what he wants to do next. Yeah, well, I mean, he basically said that he's happy to fight any weight. What, what he calls it is money weight. He's happy to fight at 185, 205, heavyweight, whatever basically brings the money. Um, and you're right, he, he is a natural heel. I sometimes feel when I watch King Mo fight, you know, he should be he should be in the UFC. He shouldn't be fighting guys like mm. Dustin Jacoby and, you know, some of the guys that are maybe not quite as elite. I really would like to see him inevitably uh, in the UFC, testing himself uh, uh, amongst the elite. But, of course, he signed that new deal, so that's not going to happen for a long time. Uh, up next was the uh, bizarre, bizarre fight announcement between Tito Ortiz and Stefan mm-hmm. Bonner. I felt like I was watching something from WCW. <laughs> I felt like Shockmaster oh, was going to pop out of, like, <laughs> behind a curtain somewhere. <laughs> Seriously, that was... Uh, this is one of those things that's going to go down as one of those infamous things in MMA where people try and like shake their head and forget about it. It was very, very pro wrestling. I mean, I'm pretty sure the whole thing was scripted. Uh, Stefan Bonner looked like he was doing his best to remember that promo that he was memorizing earlier on. <laughs> then there was that guy in the weird burka. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's meant to be like some kind of weird announcement <laughs> like yeah Tito you forgot this guy and then he takes off his mask and no one knows who the hell he is <laughs> he looks like he looks like a jobber from like early WCW days and then obviously Tito got on the stick then there was some pushing and shoving uh, Bonner was doing his uh, best Nicolas Cage impression and looking crazy <laughs> um, it looked a little bit bush league I mean I, I like Scott Coker and Bellator is a really fun product but um, I didn't hear anything from Dana White about this one. But if people ask him, he's gonna he's gonna rip them to shreds. It was it was really bush league in my opinion. What did you think, Dennis? Yeah, you know, when Scott Coker took over Bellator, I sort of um, I expected him to take it into a direction where he'd have big fights. I really felt like they made a mistake by doing this during the show. Uh, Bonner and Tito had a great exchange of words through Twitter, and I thought that was enough to drive the heat behind the fight. I didn't think that it was necessary for Bonner to get in there with uh, Ultimo Dragon there with the cornrows. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was just – it was absolutely horrible, and it didn't work whatsoever. Tito Ortiz is a horrible actor. Stefan Bonner is even worse. And then they try and recreate the pushing, shoving thing that Jones and Cormier did. It was, mm. it was absolutely horrible. Um, and I think it, yeah, it, it was, it was a laughing stock. I had a look on Twitter. There was a lot of reaction to. It. A lot of people thought, you know, they love watching the train wreck. A lot of people were really turned off from the fight. Now, um, you know, obviously both Hall of Famers. I think they could have gone a different route in building this fight. I think a, a normal countdown and some normal beef at press conferences would have been enough. Yeah, it was very, very weird. I hope Scott Coker doesn't go down in this direction because it just does not work in MMA. And um, it might, in, the, in the pro wrestling world, something like this might work. But when you bring it over to, to MMA, like you mentioned, it looks very, very, very Bush League. And um, he's got to avoid that because last time when Tito Ortiz came out before that uh, Rampage Jackson fight, that was horrible. And a lot of people were turned off from the fight because it was so cheesy. Mm. And yeah, it, this this is cheese cheese meister to the max. So hopefully Scott Coker steers away from this in the future because I'm afraid the brand's going to become a bit of a joke if this kind of stuff keeps happening. I really do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, this is MMA, not wrestling. And I, I'm one of the people, and I think Dennis, you are as well, where mm. wrestling and MMA in some ways, I wouldn't say they go hand in hand, but there's a lot of similarities in terms of promoting. At the end of the day, whether it's wrestling or MMA, there's two... Two guys on wrestling sometimes more that are going to fight whether it's real or fake on a certain day and you have to build emotional engagement with the viewer to want to buy a pay-per-view and want to watch these guys fight whether real or fake so those are the similarities but you know MMA it it just really can't get to it it can't be doing these you know mask reveals and things like that while UFC (laughs) is trying to make the you know the, the MMA a sport Bellator is basically trying to make entertainment and I think a lot of guys are realizing this whole shit talking brand is is the way to go because that's what's going to get in matches and fights mm-hmm. and that's what's going to drum up interest and I think Chael Sonnen was really the first pioneer who did that in, in MMA now everyone wants to talk shit because they realize the opportunities that Chael got through that but the problem is A, most people are not Chael Sonnen he was like I don't know he was like the fader of shit talking in MMA he, he had 
he always had a uh, sort of layer of class. He did it well, whether you think it was classy or not, it was well done and it always fit MMA well. Um, I think a lot of the promos and stuff like that transcended into MMA, but things like this, where there's a guy wearing a mask and these guys are right there, I don't think that works at all. I would have settled for seeing Tito and Stefan Bonner sitting on opposite sides of the cage. I think that would have, you know, drummed up some interest. Mm. And I think they could, mm. could have gone with the whole angle that, like, you know, like Sting and Hulk Hogan in 97, where, like, they they never met, they never touched each other, they never fought until that one night at Starcade. You know what I mean? And it was massive. I think they could have really done that, where Tito and Bonner, they never really have exchanges. They barb each other on Twitter, and then on, you know, November, whatever, 15th, or 5th, whatever the date is, that's when they finally meet, uh, as opposed to, you know, this ridiculousness. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 definitely the case, you know, where Tito had some great rivalries, like with Ken Shamrock, and that stuff, a lot of it was really intense, but it was real, and yeah. I think that's why it worked. And um, a lot of people that see this John Jones, uh, Daniel Cormier thing think this is the only way to go. But these two guys are Hall of Famers. They're accomplished fighters. You can go down a different route. You can you can uh, talk about their credentials. You can talk about the stuff that they've done. You can talk about the fact they've never fought each other before. You can sell it just on the history alone. And you don't have to go down a cheap path to make it, you know, just a laughing stock. I think people would have watched it regardless because they both have name value. And, you know, if they treated the fight with some respect, I think a lot more people would give the fight respect. So that's just my two cents on the whole thing. Honestly, man, I feel like I, I should have, I feel like, I was expecting Mike Tanay to bust out with something. I feel like I was watching <laughs> TNA. Seriously, I, I really did. Um, on to the main event. Obviously, featherweight title changing hands. Pre uh, Patricia Ferreira against Pat Curran. Uh, just a few fun facts. They last obviously fought in January 2013. This is the rematch. Uh, Pat won the first one. And uh, Pat, Pat last beat Daniel Strauss in a rematch to earn the featherweight belt. I mean, that belt is basically playing hot potato. Uh, in this fight, man, it was all Patrizio. Both guys, they showed success on the feet. Uh, but Patricio really outclassed him. You know, he dropped Pat Curran a few times. By the time the decision rolled around, everybody knew it was going to be Patricio. Um, it was a fun fight. It's It was a really good fun fight. Um, a bit of a long one to finish off the Bellator show. I feel like King Mo and the Lashley fight... Uh, and even the Bonner and Tito announcement and the Congo versus Johnson, you know, they were like quick bursts of excitement. This one was a lot longer, uh, but nevertheless, it was a good fight. And uh, congratulations to Patricio. Uh, you know, I'm very curious to see who he fights next in Bellator and if he can indeed hold on to that, uh, to the uh, featherweight scrap. But that's enough about Bellator. We are running long. We've already had a few guests. We still have to talk about UFC at Foxwoods. Uh, Dennis, what did you think of the event uh, to kick it off? Oh, man, I'll tell you what, um, this isn't anything fight-related. When I saw that venue, I was like, what is this? Are we back in the UFC uh, six days or something where it was one of those tiny little casinos and three people mm. were in attendance? I think it hurt the vibe a little bit, I'll be honest. And this this is the kind of thing that doesn't affect a lot of people, but affects guys like me, and I like that big arena feel. Um, you have a couple of heavyweight, big heavyweight fights on, but you, the cage looked tiny, and you know the arena looked tiny, and when the guys walked in, it just didn't have that build up because it was three steps from the back to to the octagon. Basically, um, it was hilarious to see him walking through that casino carpet. You know, they show the the yeah. amazing casino outside. It's like, come on, man! It's like there's like one one slot machine in there, and and probably some old ballroom with some Elvis impersonator in the back. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting to see. It was really interesting, to, and it's Connecticut already. So you're like, all right, look, this isn't the biggest market. But yeah, it was interesting to see you have seen that environment. I haven't seen them in an environment like that for a long time. A long, long time since back in the day when they did the old school fight night. So it was a little bit weird to see that. Guys like Alistair Overeem in a venue like that. He must have had a, you know, the, the, the valet must have pulled up and he would, would have been like, this is where we're fighting, really? Mm. Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, that's that's just one of the th first things I thought. What about, you, what about you, Cass? You know, it's something that I think was subliminally on my mind. I didn't really notice it too much until just now, but it's a very good point. Um, especially when you've got guys like Alistair over and you're right. It was a very intimate venue and it did make it feel a little bit, uh, sort of small time. Obviously the cage is smaller whenever you have events like this. Obviously they use a bigger one for pay-per-view and for the ultimate fighter and the sort of, you know, small Fox cars, they use the small cage. Uh, but in terms of the fights, I mean, I think we're running a bit over time, so we'll quickly, uh, let let's you do it. Know. Yeah, let's, let's kick it off. Yeah, with the prelims, you obviously had featherweight Chaz Skelly uh, beat Sean Soriano. Uh, Chris Beal, no sexy flying knees, but he did beat uh, Takeki Matsuda. Uh, Rafael Natal defeated Chris Camozzi. I like Chris Camozzi. Uh, Al Iaquinta defeated Rodrigo. <laughs> Damn. 
I really wish uh, I would really wish for Rug was there to, to announce Rug. <laughs> damn, like damn. Uh, and John Moraga defeated Justin Scoggins with a very sexy submission in the second round. Guillotine. Mm. Uh, now onto the main card. Lightweight. It's Joe Lozon beating Michael Chiesa. A little mm. bit of controversy there. Dennis, what did you think? And do you think it was a warranted stoppage? I thought that uh, J-Lo um, had such a tough year. I was happy to see him get the win. He doesn't move his head around uh, enough in, in fights. He gets uh, too many punches to his face. I like to see him incorporate a bit more head movement. I think the fight needed to be stopped, man. That cut was really, really big. And I, last thing anyone wants to see is someone getting hurt in MMA. So my short answer is, even though I think the fight could have gone on, I, I would have really hated to see um, a, a young guy uh, get hurt in the octagon because, you know, because uh, they, let, they let the fight go on. And uh, at the end of the day, it's all about the safety in a sport like that. So, you know, it was disappointing to see the fight end on that uh, on that note, but uh, I was I was happy for JLA. What did you think? Yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, you know, I'm happy Joe Lozo. He had a really tough year. And I, I like Michael Chiesa. Oh, sorry, Chiesa. Uh, he's, he's another guy that's really coming up in the lightweight division. Uh, as far as the gash, man, that was a big, deep gash. Similar to like yeah. a Diego Sanchez, BJ Penn fight. Um, yeah, yeah no, nah, definitely the right call to make. It was a bit upsetting at the start because it was a really good fight. And I think most anyone was going to say that it was going to be fight of the night. Even before the fight even started, you know that's this is probably going to be the fight of the night. A uh, mm. bit of a shame to see it end like that. Michael Chiesa was obviously very pissed off. He said, I'm not fucking fighting until I get a rematch. <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I don't know if they're really going to necessarily make that a rematch. I think with Ross Pearson and Melvin Gallard, it kind of ended similarly. No rematch after that one. Um but yeah, unnecessary but- rematch. Unnecessary. I mean, great fight, and maybe they'll meet down the line. But I think that uh, Chiesa, he's a, he's a super superstar in the rising. And maybe if he was en route to lose the fight, maybe he would have won. But maybe he would have lost. He still comes out as a superstar here. He hasn't lost any credibility in a lot of people's books. So you can still book him in a big fight. And I don't think a rematch is necessary just yet. Yeah. No. Um. Moving on, heavyweights, Matt Mitrione, the Beige Beast against the Black Beast, Derek Lewis. <laughs> the Beige Beast. I feel like if I say the White Beast, uh, you know, there's going to be bad connotations there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Matt, this is going to be basically a who's getting knocked out first. There was no way this is going to be making the dist- uh, the go in the distance, which usually when you say means it's generally going to be a draw followed by a no contest. Uh, but in this case, I mean, Derek Lewis, this was, this could have been his coming out party. Matt Mitrione, he's no joke. He's a big guy, former NFL player, very agile on his feet, uh, pretty quick, decent strikes, a uh, hell of a lot of knockout power, not the most in terms of ground game, but we weren't really worried that he was going to go there this time. Derek Lewis, untested. People are still not mm. 100% sure on the Black Beast. You know, is he going to be the next uh, Brett Rogers or LeVar Johnson, or is he going to be the next uh, Junior Dos Santos? No, he's, he's not going to be the next Junior Dos Santos, but <laughs> he's a guy, uh, his last couple of fights, what I noticed is obviously he's got a lot of power. Everybody noticed. Ray Charles noticed that he's got a lot of power, but, um, you know, he didn't really show speed. He didn't show agility. So I didn't really like his chances in this fight. I kind of thought Matt Mitrione, given that he's got more experience, he's been under the bright lights before on the main stage. He's been working at it for a lot longer, you know, trains with Chris Lydell. I thought, this is definitely Mitrion's fight, unless he gets caught. In this case, man, we didn't even see the start. The fight start. Uh, Derek Lewis basically ran into like a forearm slash elbow. It was bizarre. <laughs> it was like I think it was was it Tom Blackledge that sort of ran into Matt Mitrion and just almost knocked himself out when he went for a takedown. Similar story here. Derek Lewis almost knocked himself out in this sense. Uh, what did you think of the fight, Dennis? Well, you know, I exactly, I thought exactly the same thing as you I had to watch the replay a few times to figure out exactly what happened. Um, but, you know, Matt Mitrion, you either get two guys. You get a guy that doesn't do very well. Um, I think when, when he fought Brendan, we saw a really bad version of Matt Mitrion and um, I expected a lot more from him. And this Matt Mitrion looked, uh, looked great. You know, he looked, he looked very, very impressive. Um, Obviously, after the fight, I think he's been like he, like uh, uh, Twitter mentioned. I think he's been hanging out with the NWA. A lot of uh, hood references there. Yeah. I think Matt needs to calm down a little bit, coming in with country songs and going all hood at the end. <laughs> but um, he he's a personality. He's not yeah. necessarily someone that 
uh, knows what he's saying half of the time, um, you know, but he's, he's definitely a personality. He's a superb athlete. And, um, yeah, the, you know, the Black Beast, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's still going to be interesting to see what happens with him in the future. It was, it was a good stoppage. Um, it was an interesting shot that hit him. And I'm excited to see what they do with Matt Mitchell and the Black Beast. You know, the heavyweight division isn't that stacked. Yeah. So they could definitely get a bit of a bit of mileage out of the Black Beast, even if he does lose a couple more fights. I still think he's got a little bit of hype left behind him. He's still got a lot to prove, you know. That that was just a weird shot. And sorry, it was Phil DeFreeze mm. that ran into Matt Mitra and not Tom Blackledge. Well, look, he's he's still got a lot to prove. It's it was a bizarre shot, a bizarre way to end a fight. Um, not to say that it was controversial, but I just think, you know, Derek Lewis, he lost, he can come back, he can come back stronger, he can learn from this mistake. And I think he just he really needs to tighten up his game. That's the main thing. And uh, I'm sh- I'm pretty sure before he leaves the UFC, he'll get at least a couple more knockouts under his belt. Uh, Mitch, Matt Mitra, on the other hand, man, you can't. You can't put that guy in a category. There's nothing cliche about him. I mean, he's this big guy. He speaks really fast. He comes out of country. He's like, he looks crazy, but then he sings and like, you know, I don't know. I, I like Mitrion. He, he's an awesome character in MMA. Uh, another heavyweight fight next up was obviously Ben Rothwell uh, defeating Alistair Overeem. Man, this Jesus. is... This is an interesting one, you know, Alistair Overeem, <laughs> we didn't really get a chance to talk about this much last week, but um, I think a lot of people, including myself, thought this is Alistair Overeem's last chance to basically prove that he's still a contender, he's still up there, you know, he had those two bad losses that he was winning and then ended up fumbling to uh, Bigfoot Silver and then Travis Brown, people thought, man, those were gimme fights, those are fights that should shoot him up to the title, uh, and then he obviously had that fight against Frank Mir, where he kind of had that nice, quiet win. People were saying a Conor Ream, the more economic version of Alistair Overeem, he fought smart fight, good. And then his big comeback against Ben Roth. Well, man, it all it all came came undone for Alistair Overeem. What did you think, Dennis? I'll tell you what, man. I had this gut feeling that Ben Rothwell was going to beat him, and yeah. those odds were just so so crazy. I mean. A lot of people would have made a lot of money if they knew what they were doing in that fight. Um, you know, Alistair Overeem has been on our show a couple of times now. And guys, you should jump on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash submission radio AU to check out our last interview with him. It was a really great interview and we really got to go into the head of Alistair Overeem and where he was leading up to this fight. I really expected a different Alistair Overeem. He came out and he did, you know, the signature John Jones kicks to the knee and mm. he looked all right. He landed some great shots. But the big problem for me is... Uh, with Alistair, and this is what we spoke to Coach Wink about on the show when he was on our show before, and Bas Rutten said this as well, um, the importance of him keeping his hands up to his chin when he when he's striking. Um, he had his hands down too low, um, and it, it just costs the guy. He needs to have those hands right up there and blocking the shots because he just can't take the shots in heavyweight anymore, and it was just really disappointing to see because although he, had a, he, he started off the fight really well, he just can't take much punches to the chin, and unless he finds a way to cover up that chin in his fights or um, fig- figures out a way to finish him off before they can even land a punch, he's not going to have much of a career left. Now, somebody made a good, uh, a really good case for him going over to Bellator and becoming the new heavyweight champion. That could happen in the future if he loses another fight. Wow. He costs so much money to the UFC per fight. I don't see Dana uh, keeping him around for another fight if he loses another one. Uh, that's just my thoughts on um, Alistair, and it's really sad to see because he's such a superstar. Everybody really wants to see Alistair go in there and dominate, but it was it's just not meant to be, and I think I I've lost a lot of my confidence in Alistair and his chin. And unless something drastic happens with Alistair, I just don't see him making any sort of impact in the division. Now, the reason why he beat Frank Mir and it wasn't a very impressive win was just because Frank just doesn't have the power and the shots to, to take him out. But if you go up against any decent striker in the heavyweight division, you know, Alistair, you know, he would go out. And that's really sad to say. Well, let's not forget, there's a lot of sides to this. Let's not forget Ben Rothwell, he does hit very hard. He can knock, you know, almost anyone out in the heavyweight mm. division. Uh, him and him and Mark Hunt had an absolutely crazy fight. Um, with Alistair, you know, this is another thing we spoke to Coach Wink about when he was on the show, was that he really needs to move and get out of the way. Sometimes Alistair, he's got a lot of power, but he kind of plods forward. If you notice, he goes in, he throws a shot, and then he just stands there. And that's usually when he gets hit. So I like to see him using those oblique kicks or whatever they're called, those John Jones kicks. Cool. He's got a lot of power in those. Very different to obviously the Muay Thai style that uh, he, he sort of grew up doing, the, you know, sort of the leg kicks. 
So it's good to see him evolving his game. One thing is, obviously, he's been training with Greg Jackson and uh, Coach Winkle John up in uh, Albuquerque. And what usually happens to guys there is they get a little bit smaller, they get a little bit leaner, their cardio becomes better. They're obviously training at altitude and their game plans become tighter. Now, we saw Alistair over him a lot smaller. I think he was wearing 248 uh, or 247, which is a lot smaller than we've seen him for quite a while. And uh, mm. I really I really expected, look, he might come in there, be a very smart ream, uh, move a lot, a lot more head movement, a lot quicker, a lot more agile, in and out, in and out. You know, he, need, he needs to basically change his style. He can't go in there and just stand in front of these guys, especially not a guy mm. like Ben Rothor. He needs to be like the running man. He needs to be like, Carlos Condit against Nick Diaz. Go in there, pick his shots, bam, get out of there. Because he just, unfortunately, he doesn't have the chin for heavyweight. Um, you know, he's a guy who came up from light heavyweight. Yeah, he's 6'5", and he's a big guy. A lot of his mass, you know, comes comes from his body, not his head. He doesn't have, you know, the biggest head. He doesn't have the biggest chin. And I think he, you know, can he still be a force in the heavyweight? Well, I mean, I think he certainly has the skills, but he just needs to make a lot of changes. And as, as we tweeted uh, just after the fight, it's kind of crazy because the stand-up world... That used to be Alistair's game. You know, if you stand with Alistair, you're probably going down. Now, it's like every minute that he's standing, it's a gamble. It's a big gamble for Alistair. So, I think it's tough because he's been doing it for so long. And it's very tough to, as the old saying goes, teach an old dog new tricks. So, for a guy that's had so much experience and done the same thing for a long, long time, it's going to be tough for him to change up his style. But that's basically what he needs to. Now, if Al if Andre Arlovsky can come back from the dead the way he did then I think anyone can. If Mark Hunt can come back from the dead like he did, I think anyone can. So I don't think Alistair Overeem's done in the division, and I don't see him going to Bellator because, uh, A, he's going to want a lot of money from Bellator anyway, and Alistair Overeem, he's still a draw. People will still... For, you know, people still want to tune in to watch him fight. I just think a lot of the mystique was shattered, and I think with Bigfoot and with Travis Brown, it was almost like, not to say that there was excuses, but he was winning those fights. He was winning those fights decisively, um, and then he made a few mistakes in the Travis Brown fight. You know, he gassed himself going for the finish against Bigfoot. He was too cocky. In this fight, there really aren't any excuses. I mean, Alistair did go on to say that he heard Ben Rothwell's arm break, and he didn't think that he was going to attack with that same arm. And he, he basically admitted that he made a mistake. Well, it was a very costly mistake. And now, unfortunately, he's, I think, uh, what, three and two in the UFC. That sucks, man. That's t that's tough. That Junior Dos Santos fight is all but going out the window. And now the question is, man, who does he fight next? Who do you put him up against? You're going to put it, you're going to have to put him up against, what, like a Sean Jordan or someone like that. It's tough. So, and a guy like Sean Jordan could knock him out. And the thing I want to ask you and I want to find out your opinion is, lose, if he loses one more fight, do you think the UFC will keep him? That's a tough one. I don't think they will because he's expensive and he's obviously... If he loses another fight, I think his title hopes of being the heavyweight champion in the UFC are all but done. Um, and it's, it's yeah. interesting because, you know, a few years ago when people were talking about Cain Velasquez versus Alistair Overeem, man, it was like a toss and, uh, you know, a pick and fight, you know, people couldn't choose. And now you just see more and more the way that Cain Velasquez would, you know, evidently dismantle Overeem. It's just, it's tough, you know, if you're in the pay-per-view business, if you're going to book a fight, Overeem for the title, people need to believe that he can win that title. And this isn't a case where, oh, he lost one, but he can win another one, much like Alexander Gustafsson, he's back in the title hunt. Overeem really is on the ground level now. And he has to climb that ladder all the way to the roof if he wants a title shot in the UFC again. Yeah, you know, and you know, this is going to be sound really negative, and I love Alistair Overeem, mm. but I honestly can't see him winning any fights in the UFC just because he can't take a punch. And he, he, he I thought he looked great against um, Rothwell in a lot of parts in the fight before he got <clears throat> knocked out, and like you mentioned, didn't really move his head. But, you know, he's still got to be able to take some strong shots because it, it it's very rare that he'll have a fight where he just finishes the guy in the first round. I mean, it's likely because he's got those strong shots. But, I mean, against an elite guy, you know, they'll definitely land at least a few strong shots across his chin. And now everybody's going to be targeting that chin because they know that, you know, he might not be able to wear those punches. And I'm just afraid that it's one of those cases where he's been fighting for so long, like we've seen with a lot of these other fighters, where they just can't take the punches. And it's such a tough division. Like you mentioned, he's got the small head. He, he came up from light heavyweight. Let's not forget he was so much bigger back in his prime. Um, mm. He's a lot smaller now. All that stuff, the, the knockouts, 
that have already happened to him, the damage that he's already taken. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those cases where you wish you could you could go, you could be a magical fairy or something, and you could do a spell on him where his chin holds up to the rest of his skill set because he's such an exciting fighter. But yeah, I'm hoping, and you know what, we'll get Coach Wink on, Wink on the show when we get an opportunity to discuss what what they're planning on doing with him in the future to sort of uh, fix this stuff. And I'm interested to see what he says. Just you know, something else that I thought about. You know, what's interesting is. Uh there was two things I was going to say, one of which I forgot, but one is that Bus Rudin a long time ago mentioned about Alistair Overeem's chin and how you can't train a chin. You've either got it or you don't. You know, the Roy mm. Nelson's, the Mark Hunts, they're born with it. You can't train, you know, to yourself to take a punch. Um, and it's funny how he got so much criticism for that. Oh, Bus, you hate Overeem, all oh, this and that. And now everyone and their mother is basically critical of Alistair Overeem and the way he takes punches. So that's just another note I wanted to mention. Obviously, Bus was on our show I think at least twice now. So the interviews are up there. Talks about a lot of things. Um, the other thing is, look, remember, remember Dennis in Sydney when uh, we spoke to Greg Jackson. We had a chat to him. We were like, you know, what's the deal with Arlovsky? And he's like, look, I'm not ready to give up on him just yet. Yeah, classical yep. Greg Jackson, very positive guy. And look, he's back in the UFC. Yeah, that interesting fight against Brett Schwab. <laughs> <laughs> he's back in the UFC, and that, that's what counts. You know what I mean? Um, I got you. Yeah. If anyone could do it, what you're saying is. If anyone could do it, maybe Greg Jackson and Mike Wickeljohn could come up with something yeah. to uh, to bring out a different Alistair Overeem. I don't know. When he has his hands down, it just really, really frustrates me. And, you know, like Barsarudin said, back when he uh, was training, I believe it was called Golden Glory, was it? Yeah, uh, course, the boxing yeah. gym. Of, yeah, um, they, they made sure that he kept one hand up to his chin when he threw punches. And I think, um, and I think we spoke to Wink about this as well. I think if he wants any success, he's got to make sure he uses those hands to the best of his ability to stop those punches. But yeah, with those tiny gloves as well, it's such a tough ask, and it's easy for me to sit here and be like, "Put your hands up." But you know, the the saying goes, once you get hit in the face, all game plans go out the window. So. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with him for sure. Well, the funny thing is this was a glancing blow off the top of the head, so yeah, there's not really much you can do about those. And it's tough, man. It's he, tough. <laughs> he, he just needs to move, man. Alistair just needs to move. He, he can't, he, you know, he can't just get in there, stand still. And Anyway, we could talk about it forever. Next fight, obviously middleweight, uh, Jacare Ronaldo Souza against Gay Guard Musasi. He defeated uh, a very unmotivated-looking Musasi, which mm. in, in most cases is very hard to tell because Musasi only has one expression. That's the, I don't give a shit. Kenny Florin hilariously put it fantastically. He looks like he's waiting in line for a sandwich. <laughs> I was laughing my ass off picturing gay guy Musasi uh, waiting in line for a sandwich. But yeah, Ronaldo Souza. I actually, honestly, I had gay guy winning this fight. I thought that he was going to keep distance and pick him apart. I didn't think that Jacare's wrestling would, would be this much of a factor, but man, there I go being proven wrong. Uh, Jacare looked like an absolute beast. Didn't see too much from Jacare striking, but when, when we did, I mean, he was slinging leather. He was throwing, you know, big, powerful shots that could really put anyone out. So I was very impressed with, you know, Ronaldo Souza as a complete package. He obviously got that guillotine choke uh, in the third round. And, uh, you know, mm. gay guard, he's, he's not an easy guy to finish, really tough guy to finish. What did you think, Dennis? Yeah, you know, absolutely impressed with Jacare. I thought um, he looked amazing. Um, and, you know, the story behind him is that he's just a genetic freak. Um, went into jiu-jitsu, just smashed everybody. You could just tell from his body, the way he moves, the guy is just gifted genetically. And, um, yeah, he, he had a great game plan, like you mentioned. Just was more aggressive in this fight when he threw his punches. So much aggression behind those punches. And I felt like Masasi, <laughs> yeah, he he really wore Masasi down. When they were getting up, I don't think Masasi expected him to sort of go for that guillotine. But, man he really gave that neck to him and i think yeah even even uh even a, a normal brown belt would be able to finish that guillotine that was and that guillotine was painful i don't know if anybody who listens to the show does much grappling but if you do just imagine when you're rolling one of those really nasty guillotines where they have that whole neck and they put it on perfectly it, it would have been a real painful one and yeah it really interesting to see what happens dana white reckons one more fight before he gets a title shot what did you mm. think about that Cass? I understand what he's saying. I mean, it's, it sucks, but it is all about timing. You've obviously got Vitor mm. Belfort against Chris Weidman. That's all the way in December. Man, we're only in September now. Um, and then, yeah, what, what, what are they going to do? That's like, what, three three months away? They fight. Let's say someone gets injured. They're on the shelf for, you know, four months, six months. Then they start training, prepare. I mean... Yeah, Chris Weidman, by the time December rolls around, he's not going to be fighting again for quite a while, at least, you know, four or five months. So it makes sense that Jacare has another fight. Uh, the only tough thing is, Dana White was talking about possibly a Leota Machida fight. 
um, in which case could be bad because if Lyoto Machida does beat Jacare, which I mean I don't even know that he would, but if he does, then what? Machida's back in the title hunt. Yeah. I kind of you know I'm sick of these rematches. I love I love Machida. I kind of wanted him to win against Chris Wyman because I really wanted mm. to see you know part two of the the Machida era. The first one ended so abruptly, but I really want to see Jacare against Chris Wyman. You know that's one of those ones where if it never happens, I think he's going to be a massive sin. Uh, and then you've got obviously <laughs> Tim Kennedy against Yoel Romero. So I. I think those are two guys that could be contenders as well. So again, I don't like, you know, getting rid of one contender, kind of like Alexander Gustafsson and uh, Rumble Johnson. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a fun fight, but I kind of don't want that to happen because then you've got mm. two possible contenders in a thin division and, and you're eliminating one of them. So I don't know. I don't know who Jacare is going to verse, but my money would be it's either going to be Lerdo Machida, uh, Tim Kennedy, or Yael Romero. Bisping and uh, Rockholder are obviously booked. They're the main event in Sydney for November the 5th. Big one. Cel- the big oh, Sydney main event. Thank God they gave us a good fight. November Everybody 8th, sorry. Can celebrate now. I know, yeah. celebrations. How awesome awesome as that um very curious to see how the undercard is going to come together but that is absolutely awesome uh i really a lot, of, a lot of fun for submission radio getting a chance to uh see some of that trash suck up close oh that's going to be sick uh we'll be there we'll be, we'll be doing <laughs> interviews uh it's going to be crazy tap out round with uh luke rockhold in the flesh tap out round with michael bisping it's going to be sick hopefully we get tyron i'm uh, not sorry woodley sorry hector lombard on that card as well possibly mm-hmm. against tyron woodley because there's a lot of shit talk between those guys uh, Hector Lombard calling him fake and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah, sky's the limit. All in all, I think we've got to wrap up because otherwise we're going to be here for, for six days talking about the fights. Great weekend, awesome weekend. Uh, congratulations to Invicta, another solid show. UFC, another one in the bag, and Bellator, a lot of fun there. Uh, thanks for tuning in again, guys. Obviously, we can be, always be found at uh, Twitter, at Submission AUS. Subscribe to the channel if you like it. Give us a like. Another episode next week. More sexy guests, more things coming at you. Dennis, any last parting words for the fans? All the jiu-jitsu heads out there, jump on the uh, YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash submission ready AU. We've got an exclusive interview with Kit Dale. We do mm. a tap out round face to face. We ask that we come up with some alternative nicknames for the sheriff and we find out what he thinks about PEDs and MMA. And he's got an in, in MMA in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he's got a big opinion on that as well. So make sure you check out that interview and a big thank you to Cadell for that one. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. And a big thank you to all our guests for this week. We'll be back with another one next week. More guests. Till then, that's us. Peace out. <laughs>